Distinguished guests, welcome to the second Incheon Law and Business Forum, which is co-organized by the United Nations Commission on International Trade Law, Regional Center for Asia and the Pacific, the Ministry of Justice of the Republic of Korea, as well as Incheon Metropolitan City, and supported by the Hong Kong International Arbitration Center and the Korean Commercial Arbitration Board International. I'm Eunyoung Nam, legal expert at Onsitera Regional Center on second month from the Ministry of Justice, Republic of Korea. It's my great pleasure to be your MC for the forum. We are honored to have speakers from different parts of the world participating in our two-day virtual event. The theme of this forum is Navigating the Storm, Helping MSMEs Set Sail with Legal Harmonization and we'll explore the business, legal and policy considerations involved in the various legal obstacles MSMEs face throughout their life cycles and how legal harmonization include unsterile tax can assist MSMEs. Before beginning today's event, may I remind all participants of some housekeeping matters. This event has been recorded and will be posted on the Onsitra event webpage, along with the presentation slide with the consent of the speakers in the course. The program and speaker bio notes can be also found on the webpage. Our event facilitator, Onsitra Archive Legal Expert Jenny Hui, will be posting links to the relevant material, including Onsitra text, in the chat box throughout the event. For our panelists, please remain muted with your cameras off unless you are speaking. Please also turn on your cameras for the group capture with the secretary of Uncitra after her opening remarks. Group captures of each panel will also be taken at the beginning or at the end of each panel at the prompt of your moderator. So I will be a participant. Thank you for your advanced questions. Additional questions are welcome via the Q&A box and will be addressed during the Q&A session at the end of each panel. Due to time limitation, panelists may not be able to address all questions. If you have technical difficulties, please email onsitra.archap at un.org. Thank you. To start off the forum, it is our great honor to have Mr. Park Omge, Minister of Justice, Republic of Korea, to deliver the opening remarks.국내기빈여러분안녕하십니까대한민국법무부장관박범계입니다동부가평화번영의중심대한민국인천에서열리는제2회인천로엠비즈니스포럼에서인사드리게된것을매우기쁘게생각합니다우선이번뜻깊은행
따라서 중소기업의 위기는 곧 세계 경제의 위기입니다. 팬데믹을 겪으면서 우리는 국가 간 이동의 제한, 교역, 위축 등으로 역량 있는 중소기업들이 더 이상 버티지 못하고 무너져버리는 힘든 시기를 지나고 있습니다. 그러나 어두운 터널 끝에는 밝은 출구가 있는 법입니다. 지금의 위기도 철저한 준비만 있으면 기회가 될수 있습니다. 지금의 시점을 실기하지 않고 적극 활용하여 중소기업 분야의 법 제도를 개선하고 중소기업 친화적인 법제를 마련하여 한 단계 더 도약하여야 합니다. 이번 포럼에서 논의될 다양한 국제 규범들은 운시트럴과 그 회원국, 옵서버들이 모여 중소기업의 입장에서 생각하고 중소기업의 니즈를 충족하기 위해 치열하게 고민하고 연구한 귀한 결과물입니다. 이번 포럼이 세계 각국 법제를 중소기업 친화적으로 만드는 데큰 도움을 줄 것이라고 확신하며 오늘과 내일 이틀간 행사에서 건설적인 제안과 심도 있는 토론이 이루어지기를 기대합니다. 대한민국 법무부는 중소기업 스타트업을 위한 법 제도 개선, 적극적인 법률 지원을 통해 우리 중소기업이 경제의 새로운 주역으로 비상할 수 있도록 조력하고 있습니다. 저는 중소기업 스타트업과 간담회를 열어 그들의 목소리를 직접 듣고 이를 정책에 반영하기 위해 노력하고 있습니다. 이 자리에 모이신 전문가들께서 주시는 의견 또한 저희 직원들과 적극 검토하여 앞으로의 법무정책에 반영하도록 하겠습니다. 한편 이번 포럼은 우리 법무부와 인천시, 운시트럴 세 기관의 동행을 기념하는 뜻깊은 시간이기도 합니다. 지난 2012년에 운시트럴 최초의 지역사무소가 인천 송도에 자리 잡은 이래로 법무부 인천시 운시트럴은 아시아태평양 지역 국제거래 규범 발전을 위해 여러 방면에서 협력해 왔습니다. 그리고 지난주 저와 인천시장 그리고 유엔 법무실장의 서명으로 운시트럴 아태 지역사무소 운영 지원을 위한 업무 협약이 갱신되어 2026년까지 세 기관의 파트너십을 이어나갈 수 있는 법적 근거가 마련되었습니다. 운시트럴 아태 지역사무소가 대한민국 정부와 함께 아시아 태평양 지역 국가들이 법제도 발전에 긍정적 영향을 주고 있음을 매우 자랑스럽게 생각합니다. 내외 규빈 여러분 아무쪼록 인천 로엔 비즈니스 포럼이 참석하는 모든 분들께 의미 있는 시간이 되기를 바라며 여기 계시는 모든 분들의 건강과 안전을 기원합니다. 감사합니다. Thank you, Minister. Would you please join me in welcoming Ms. Anna z b i n g b r e t the Secretary of UNCITRA, to deliver her opening remarks? Anna, please. Mr. b y u n g k i Park, Minister of Justice, Republic of Korea. Mr. Nam Chun Park, Mayor of Incheon Metropolitan City, distinguished speakers and friends of UNCITRA. Greetings from Vienna. It's my great pleasure to welcome you to the second Incheon Law and Business Forum organized by the United Nations Commission on International Trade Law, Regional Center for Asia and the Pacific, UNCITRAL RCAP, the Ministry of Justice of the Republic of Korea, Incheon Metropolitan City, and our principal supporters, the Hong Kong International Arbitration Center and the Korean Commercial Arbitration Board International, KCAB International. I thank all our partners for their excellent collaboration in the smooth and efficient organization of this year's virtual forum. The Incheon Law and Business Forum was inaugurated in September 2019 as an interactive platform for legal policy and business experts to discuss new dimensions of trade and investment where commercial legal harmonization and citral specialty might be desirable, especially for the Asia Pacific region. 
The first Incheon Law and Business Forum thus embarked on the theme of challenges of doing business in the digital economy in Asia and the Pacific. And I was delighted that feedback from the many regional experts that presented at that forum was able to inform Ancitral's exploratory work at the time on legal aspects related to artificial intelligence and smart contracts, the use of distributed ledger technology and cross-border data flows. Since the inaugural forum, new challenges to cross-border trade have arisen. The severe economic fallout from the interventions required to mitigate the effects of the pandemic is unprecedented. And the COVID-19 crisis will continue to disrupt international trade and economic activity in the foreseeable future. At the same time, new opportunities have arisen and the digitization of economy has accelerated exponentially. However, while sophisticated multinational players are well equipped to navigate these stormy waters, micro, small, and medium-sized enterprises, the backbone of most global economies, as we have heard from Minister Park, this is the case also in Korea, urgently need access, assistance to set sail. This year's forum thus brings together representatives from the law, business, and public sectors to discuss with candor the hurdles to integrating MSMEs, particularly those in the Asia-Pacific region, into the mainstream economy. Ancitral has long prioritized MSMEs by following the think small first principle, according to which commercial law reform should start with a focus on the actual needs of the smallest businesses and avoid placing unnecessary hurdles and legal burdens on them. To this end, the two-day program follows the obstacles MSMEs may face throughout their life cycle, highlighting how Ancitral is already working to reduce the legal obstacles uh, and exploring new areas in which further legal harmonization may be needed. Today's program commences with the very critical step to transitioning MSMEs into the formal economy simplified business registration and formation, which specifically supports target three of the sustainable development goals of the United Nations, and it's SDG eight more specifically. Easing and thus increasing incorporation enhances cost efficiency and facilitates access to finance. As Ancitral is commencing work in this area, I look forward to the interactive roundtable on foundational and new dimensions of MSME financing, comprising experts from the field and MSME representatives from across the region. Day two opens with a dynamic snapshot of MSMEs in the digital age, including how digital technology is transforming corporate governance and the opportunities that the new ecosystem presents for MSMEs. An examination of fresh starts for MSMEs then follows as micro and small business insolvencies are unfortunately expected to rise dramatically due to the pandemic. The forum concludes with an expert panel on how arbitration and mediation offer less costly and faster dispute resolution for MSMEs with practical examples from the legal and business sectors. Let me end by reiterating Ancitral's appreciation to our partners, the Ministry of Justice, Incheon Metropolitan City, Hong Kong IAC, and KCIB International for joining forces with us to transform this regional forum into a virtual global dialogue. Approximately 400 participants are joining, not only from Asia and the Pacific, but also from Africa, from the Americas, and from Europe, to follow these meaningful exchanges on how legal harmonization can help MSMEs successfully navigate turbulent waters. A special note of thanks to the government of the Republic of Korea for extending the Memorandum of Understanding between the United Nations, the Ministry of Justice, 
and Incheon Metropolitan City to support the operation of the Ancetral Regional Center for Asia and the Pacific for an additional five years through 2006. The two, 2026, sorry. And Minister Park has alluded to it in his uh, opening remarks. The Republic of Korea has contributed approximately 5 million US dollars to the regional center since its 2012 opening in Incheon, enabling Amcitral to effectively execute its mandate throughout the Asia Pacific. The port of Incheon, a global gateway to the Asia Pacific, and the image of the Incheon Bridge that I have in my background, that provides, thus provides the perfect backdrop for our discussions. If we cannot meet in person, we can at least bring Incheon closer to your view virtually for the time being. I eagerly look forward to hosting the Incheon Law and Business Forum in person once again in the near future. Therefore, on behalf of Ancitral, please accept my sincere appreciation and well wishes for this year, for this year's forum. Thank you very much and best of luck with your deliberations. Thank you very much, Anna. As announced, I would like to invite the speakers and moderators to take a group photo with Anna. Could you please turn on your cameras? Okay, since now we have everyone in the angle, so yes, please take a screen capture, smile. It's done? Yes. Okay, thank you very much, Anna and the speakers. Now we will invite the mayor of Incheon Metropolitan City, Republic of Korea, Mr. Park Nam Chun, to deliver his welcome speech. Hello, I am Park Nam Chun, mayor of Incheon Metropolitan City. It's a pleasure to meet you all. Let me first congratulate you on the opening of the Incheon Law and Business Forum. I also would like to thank Ms. Atita Komendru, head of the Uncitral Regional Center for Asia and the Pacific, and everyone involved for your tireless efforts to prepare this wonderful event. Also, I am delighted to welcome Justice Minister Park Bomge and the Secretary of Uncitral Anna Zubin Brett, who are gracing us with your presence today, as well as all the speakers and the presenters from all around the world. As you know, Incheon has home to 15 international organizations, including UNCITRAL, is a city of cooperation and coexistence. Our experience of the COVID-19 pandemic is a reminder that we can overcome the universal crisis only when the entire world comes together to seek mutual prosperity, going beyond the boundaries between cities and countries. International organizations have promoted various initiatives for global cooperation and coexistence. Their role will become even more critical in the post-COVID-19 era. And Incheon will also join in their preparations for the better future. We will provide more active support to help them carry out their duties more smoothly and to create a better environment for people from different cultures to enjoy a present life. Furthermore, we will make sure to create the optimal settings for safe and convenient international conferences before welcoming international guests back to the city. Once again, I thank you for joining us today and hope this forum serves as a great venue to gather the wisdom and the insights from every participant 
contributing to human progress. Please remember to come back to Incha. I'll be looking forward to meeting you in person. Thank you. Without having break now, we will now begin the first panel of the event. Panel one on MSME formulation, business legislation will be moderated by Ms. Monica Kanafuria, legal, legal officer at UNCITRA in Vienna, as currently serving as secretary of UNCITRA Working Group One, micro, small and medium-sized enterprises, and coordinating the UNCITRA presence on social media. Before joining the International Trade Law Division, Monica worked for other agencies of the United Nations system. Monica is a licensed lawyer in Italy, her home country. She also holds a master's degree in public policy and management. Now I would like to invite Monica to moderate the session. Thank you, um, Hyun Yang, uh, and thank you, uh, ARCAP colleagues, for uh, um, organizing, coordinating the preparation of this um, uh, forum, uh, which is one of the flagship activities of uh, UNCITRAL in the region. I will uh, start immediately, uh, almost immediately, leaving the floor to uh, the the experts in the first panel since we do not have much time and certainly the audience is much more interested in listening to them and their experience than, than to uh, what I have to say. Just to put everything in the context, as the keynote speakers before me said, uh, expressed, uh, MSMEs are really the backbones in many economies and uh, UNCITRAL um, has uh, uh, since 2013 has started to work on um, kind of facing and addressing the legal obstacles that uh, MSMEs must, um, uh, must face. Um, because although they are the backbone, they still have uh, several, they still have to face several regulatory, legal and administrative uh, hardships. The um, UNCITRAL in these past seven, uh, eight years has adopted two texts to support MSMEs. These two texts in a way are the background for the next two panels. Um, and the two texts are the UNCITRAL legislative guide on uh, key principles of a business registry. That is the background for the first, for the opening panel on business registration. And the, importance of an effective business registry system uh, is uh, to be highlighted because an effective business registration allows not only uh, to access information but to ease the research for potential business partners, clients, sources of finance, uh, financial help and also reduce the risk uh, when you enter into business partnership with uh, uh, both domestically and internationally. Our first panelist is uh, Ms. Rosenbell, is the executive director of the Australian Security and Investment Commission. Um, she will provide an overview of the business registration in the Asia Pacific region and highlighting challenges and opportunities. Um, Ms. Bell has, of course, a very um, rich uh, background of experience, and you can read more of that in her bio in our, on our website. Uh, Roseanne, the floor is over to you. Um, thank you very much for that kind introduction. Um, I am now going to share my screen and uh, speak to you all about um, business registration. So hello and greetings from Melbourne, Australia. Uh, today I'm planning to speak to you briefly on four key topics. First, how does business registration work today in Australia? Second, what are some of the common challenges faced by registrars across the globe? Third, what opportunities are available to registrars to reform business registration and to create good practice? And fourth, I'll share some tips, uh, my own tips, on how you might know if you're on the right track in improving business registration. 
So the first question that we are often asked as a registrar is, why should I register my business to formalise it? Well, the answer might depend on what kind of business registration you're considering, as every country is different depending on its legal framework. For instance, in Australia, we most commonly register very small companies, and yet we do have some large and public companies. ASIC in Australia does not register sole traders or partnerships, although these are business types that are available. Now, an overwhelming reason that a person or people will register as a company is because they wish to operate with a limited liability structure. So a company is a separate legal entity and it has the same rights as a natural person. So it can incur debt, it can sue and be sued. The owners, called members or shareholders, can limit their personal liability and generally not be liable for the company debts. Now, a company often has higher setup costs and compliance obligations than, for example, operating as a sole trader, but the benefits of limited liability in a company can make this form of structure very favourable. We have two common types of companies in Australia, proprietary or private and public. As well as having fewer compliance obligations, a key difference between a smaller proprietary company and a public company is that with a proprietary company, there's a mechanism to stop unwanted people becoming shareholders or owners in the company. So that is one of the main reasons why the majority of family companies are proprietary companies. And it's also the reason why proprietary companies are often referred to as private companies. So the second question I often get asked, how do I go about registering my business as a company? So in Australia, our company registration process is mostly online and you can do it directly through to ASIC through our website portal or you can use a third party commercial business to support you. It will require a fee to be paid. Now, providing that you've done all of your preparation, you can register a company in just minutes. We've come a long way from the days where the only way to register is by bringing paper forms into a counter. Our website has a comprehensive uh, list of considerations before starting a company. And prior to registration, directors and members must sign a written consent, which must be retained by the company after it's registered. Now, the information needing to be provided to the registrar when, you're, when you are registering a company includes the proposed name of the company, the addresses of the company, the registered office, principal place of business, the names and addresses of directors and members, including the date and place of birth for directors, the share details and the members to whom the shares are to be issued, whether the company is to have an ultimate holding company and if so, the details and the type of company being uh, registered. Then on registration, a company is given a unique number and this unique number and the company name need to be included on all public documents issued by the business, such as letters and agreements. And then the third question I'm often asked is, what are my ongoing obligations as a business in a company and as a director? So some obligations for compliance in particular are on companies and other obligations are on directors or office holders as individuals. Generally speaking, companies need to notify the registrar of any changes to company information, such as changes to addresses. They need to undertake an annual review process, which includes paying a fee, reviewing and updating data, and passing solvency resolutions each year. They need to pay fees associated with some document lodgements. And in some cases for larger companies, they will need to lodge financial reports. Now, a key trade-off of having a formal registration of a company is transparency. So you get the benefits of limited liability and in return, you must give the registrar information it can make available so that people can know who they're doing business with and who lies behind a company. 
I mentioned that other obligations sit directly on directors and directors of companies have a number of duties that they must comply with while in office. There's three categories. The first one is general duties, and these are imposed by the law and they include things such as the general duty to exercise your powers and duties in good faith in the best interests of a company and for a proper purpose. Uh, The second category, is the duty not to trade whilst insolvent. So directors must understand and be constantly aware of the financial position of their company, um, not only once a year when they sign off their accounts. And third, directors must have a duty to keep adequate books and records. So this is needed to explain the transactions in the company and the company's financial position and performance. A failure of a director to take all reasonable steps to comply with their duties can mean they're contravening the legislation. So in summary, once they've chosen a business structure and done a company registration, it's important that both companies and their office holders are aware of their ongoing uh, obligations. So now I'd like to talk about challenges in business registration faced by registrars. Developing business business registration systems can be difficult. For many registrars, especially those with outdated registries, there is no quick fix and change such as moving your registry online can take a long time and be challenging. Some things we need to think about in taking this journey include, first, the legislation and government policy settings. It's really important that legislation is designed to allow online lodgement to occur and that it supports companies, uh, sorry, it supports registrars in cutting red tape out of the registration process to allow them to make ongoing decisions. For instance, in Australia, we removed all the requirements for a notary to physically sign documents. We also removed the requirements that paper forms must be lodged. We then need to think about our processes. There's not a lot of efficiency in automating old processes. It's much more sensible and cheaper to re-engineer your processes and then automate streamlined processes. This is where we can really cut red tape for businesses and in cutting red tape, we can get great buy-in from companies and deliver efficiencies and savings. A common challenge that we face is funding. It's really important to properly cost and fund our registry modernisations. It's often sensible to stage our change programs and to deliver them in stages, with each stage having demonstrable benefits. Now, if you're unable to get support from both government and business, you may have some difficulty getting your registration services designed and implemented. And last, we all must be be realistic because change can be hard and slow. We must remember that changing a business registration process, even for the better, can involve a big change for business and individuals. And it's very critical to partner with business and onboard them having regard to the sensitivities of what it might mean for them. And now to reforms and opportunities, where to start? Notwithstanding all of the challenges in improving our registration systems to attract small businesses, registries all over the world are successfully doing so and encouraging incorporation and the use of registry data in decision making. This slide suggests some places to start, and I've already mentioned the basics around legislative reforms and process re-engineering. Now, number three is around efficiency. Many of you know that moving registries online can deliver huge efficiencies and benefits both within the registry and for customers. And in Australia, the registry, we more than halve the size of our workforce by moving our registry services online. And at the same time, we made the work done by by our staff staff much more interesting and value-adding. Number four is around one-stop shops. Customers get so easily confused about which agency they need to go to for what and how to interact with various difficult government agencies. So one-stop shops can bring together services within an agency or across agencies. 
In Australia, we currently have a registry modernisation program underway that is going to bring together 32 legal registers from two agencies into one modernised registry. We can't wait to see the benefits. Our program is going to last three to five years and we'll see an alignment for the first time between the activities of the taxation registration and the business registration. And numbers five and six here are about partnering and benchmarking with both private practice and with other countries. So by way of example, in Australia, we work closely with private software developers and information sellers in, in running our registry. They bring great value and they offer additional value-added services to customers. In Australia, we are using a commercial off-the-shelf software to build our new modernised registry practice, leverage best practice across the world. And also in Australia, we have interoperability with our close neighbour, New Zealand. In some circumstances, we only need to lodge things in one country and they are mutually recognised by both countries. So I've said reforms can be difficult, but it can offer great benefits to businesses, individuals and government. In fact, modernising and building your register can be very exciting. So this list includes the kind of things that you might look to when you're assessing whether or not your reform program and your modernisation program is on track. I'd like to reinforce just two key points. First, the critical role of registry staff in transforming registers. Our staff and our subject matter experts are our most valuable asset and they can really help us, providing we bring them on the change journey with us and we understand how the change can impact their roles over time. And second, we need to engage our businesses and SMEs and regulated population from the beginning. We should never think that we know best what's good for small business and how they work and how they want to interact with us. So it's important to bring small businesses on the journey and use our customers in processes such as setting business requirements, testing new services, and telling us how to onboard new players. So that's my brief overview for today. And I wish all the best to those of you who are looking at how to encourage small, small and medium enterprise to formalize through business registration processes in your jurisdiction. Thank you. Thanks to you, Roseanne. This has been a very interesting journey into the, uh, into the activities and into the reform that is needed uh, to improve the business registration system. I, I, I appreciate the fact that, that the UNCITRAL uh, legislative guide on key principle of business registries capture most of what you said uh, that is happening in, uh, in Australia or that has happened in Australia to improve the business registry system. Um, I am now very pleased to also give the floor to Mr. Cesar Cordova. Uh, Cesar is the Senior Director of the Jacobs Cord Cordova and Associates. And um, he will share his experience in contributing to streamline procedures to start a business in Laos um, and another country of the Asia Pacific region. And business registration was a key component of this uh, reform exercise. Um, Cesar, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Monica, and good afternoon, good morning, or good evening for others who are not uh, in, in Korea. Uh, I'm very pleased today to share with you some experience, ideas, challenges and problems, how we solve them about Lao that we work. We work with the Ministry of Industry and Commerce and in particular with the register, DERM, the Department of Registration of the Ministry. So of course, I'm gonna be simplifying a very long project, three years of working with the government on, on this reform and, uh, and, and sharing what, 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 the, what were the successes and what are also the challenges and maybe having some time to to move along and, and tell you a little bit more about how I see the future for this type of countries who are really emerging from, from uh, in the development area 
but also not only for this type of countries, also for many rural parts of emerging countries or even more developed countries, because there you will have also firms and you will have also the need to formalize the informal, medium, small, micro areas of your economy. So in, uh, in one minute, I will try to explain this three years project. We started in 2017 with a very complex baseline. I don't want to come back to the World Bank doing business uh, statistics, but what we saw clearly is that registration was not really what registration should be. It was more trans transactional. It was basically a, a way that the authority control, in particular, for instance, the, the, the chief villages, the, 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 the villages chiefs were controlling the economy or the, the problems. It was transactional. You do this and I do that. You want to do this. I will permit you to do that. It was, of course, very discretionary of despite the laws, despite the regulation that existed, despite the, despite the institutions that existed, it was really one by one. And of course, big firms, large firms, rich firms used to have a very easy registration. Small, medium and micro didn't have that kind of, uh, of possibility. And so it took years, sometimes months, sometimes weeks, very, very improbable even to calculate what was and how it would take to register a firm. In 2019, we did the mapping. We need to, uh, to try to understand a long survey. And we tr decided to split the registration. We find that the registration was basically the principal command and control. And the registration was so long because it also used to control licenses, operational license and, and business risk market failures. So the first thing was to split registration with licensing. It was not an easy one, but we it, it was achieved. The minister agreed, the government agreed, and it was a, in a, legally a success. We also tried to move the ex anti controls into ex post controls, just because you need to really, as a firm, try to develop your, your experience, your market experience before even trying to, to produce the time and, and even the, the knowledge to, to register or to get the license, uh, licenses. We also start to, to come back to the risk-based approach to, of licenses. That means you should not license this just because you want to license, but it needs to try to license as a mitigation of risks of possible harm that a business can create. So changing even the, the the culture about that. And of course, changing this inspection function into something much more useful were, were some of the big changes in 2018. It was uh, agreed by the prime minister office. It was, everything was quite happy. But then we, a few months after that, we start to get statistics. And really what we saw is that in the, the main benchmark, the doing business laws was still getting very bad numbers, even worse numbers. So it was something, a problem. How could we accelerate this revolution? Because it was more than a reform, it was really a revolution. So of course, we, we tried to, 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 to re, 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 try to re reform the project of registration and licensing into much more, something more practical, how to communicate, how to move along these ideas, these very important ideas. That was the project. And I want to just underline some of the key pillars that we build our communication, our, our really raising awareness about the, the reforms that were made. They were made, the laws were changed, the, 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 the regulations were changed, some formats were changed, but nothing was really happening. Anyway, the first thing we, we, we wanted was to change the spirit of, of the, the, the register or the, at the local level. And we tried to, in, try to explain that registration is a public service, is not a, a control service. Registration is really trying to give um, birth certificate to business, giving them the rights and obligation of 
the rule of law that is developing, rapidly developing in Laos. So it was in a sense, our benchmark was how fast for very small firms, how fast you can get a birth certificate for a person. Well, how, how long it should take you to register a business. So you should try to, 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 to see these two procedures uh, as, uh, as similar in, in that sense, in terms of burdens, in terms of time, in terms of, of information. So again, I'm talking for very small firms, informal firms. The second, of course, was giving only one birth certificate because of course there were many institutions trying to give a birth certificate, the tax authority, the, the, the register, the, the social security, the local uh, civ uh, chief was having all their birth certificates. So we were pushing hard to, uh, to the very important idea of one business, one number. Ray, the second thing is that we, if we split the registration from the licensing operation, which used to be merged and intertwined, we find out that operating licenses was becoming the second problem. So why should you improve registration if just after that you will be faced with hundreds, dozens of, of operating licenses? So again, we try to avoid this splitting of, and, and, and moving of the problem of, of doing business in Laos. And so we, we needed to also take care about that and try to, 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 to look at, at these two startup, very important startup moments for, a, for an informal business, but also for a small and medium. That means registration and starting a business, which is in, in many developing countries so essential. And the last was of course, trying to move the control phase on small, medium enterprises from the beginning from paper controls, basically ex ante controls towards really the operations where really it is where the, the risks are, where the harm, where the market failures occur to the consumers, to the environment, to the health, to the workers is really in, during the operation, not before the operation. So these were the three pillars we worked on starting 2019. Here you can see basically the, the, the the problem we face in 2019, according you can see in in in, in the in the in, in the uh, in, in this uh, column that despite the reforms, this was what was at the beginning of the book and and the reforms we were having. Anyway, we got a very very statistics in World Bank. So there was a really a misconnection between the laws, the reforms and the reality. And actually we also find that we could easily, but really with very little reforms, go to this type of, of targets. That's what we really tried to do during the 2019-2021 project, which finished last, last May. Really not only to consolidate the reforms here, but really move them here, which were really already very close to be reached. It is, I'm not gonna go into the details, but uh, we, we, we work on a parallel way, thinking more as a startup for, for a micro informal, small and medium enterprises, improving all these, the business registration reform, the implementing reform, I am, I'm, I'm not gonna be, I don't see very well this um, and, and, and the last part. But on the other hand, really try to, trying to work on this licensing reform, because of course what happens if you, you diminish the control, the, the traditional control that existed in Laos in terms of registration, what we were very worried and we were so emerging was getting control even more decentralized by each one of the ministries, trying to control the starting up of the businesses. And so we tried to we set up an inventory and we are now in trying to, to even develop some registration of license, of course, using uh, ICT, information and communication technology. But again, the, the, we, we clearly saw that we could improve registration 
but improving the registration of Laos was opening this big problem of, of operating licenses. Where are we now moving forward? So we have worked and we have seen and basically what Rosanna said, we can continue improving further streamlining registration, training, raising awareness. For instance, it was amazing how one of the key reforms in 2018 was the elimination of the seals needed to be registered. And uh, it was still asked, even when we talk with, with, with lawyers in, in, in Vientiane who were actually some of them even uh, being in formally uh, advisors to the, to the doing business. Uh, project, they were still believing that the, the seal was requested, and it was not. And it was just uh, raising awareness about all these changes and training, even at local level, really at, at the window level, about the forms, knowing that there are official forms, that the old forms are not of officials anymore. All this was hard work, and it took a lot of time to go and we're not talking going through all Laos, just the three, four, five main cities in Laos to, to, to move this, this reform takes time and, and you need to, to, to really change the, 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 the awareness, the behaviors of both of the businesses of the, and advisors of the businesses, and of course, the, the, the registrars. We, we have continued working on the one business, one number. I think we, we were close. I don't know if we finalize it to have only one number, uh, maybe not totally the social security, but certainly using the, the tax number as registration number, which is a huge investment for the future, for ICT, for clarity, for everything. And of course, we also work on on developing the, 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 the specification for a one-line registration, which not only will, will solidify all, all, all these reforms, make it more transparent, but also reduce all the discretion that we believe still exists. So this is where we are in registration. Moving forward in, in operating licenses, as I told you, it must have been harder. It, no, the, the, what happened is the registration reform created a decentralization of licenses. Previously, all operation licenses were, were managed by the register, but now every minister, Ministry of Environment, Ministry of Labor, Minister of, of Culture, Minister of, 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 of uh, can now basically control any startup and, and can request whatever they want. So it, it was very important to, 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 to try to control this this um, very bureaucratic entrepreneurship and trying to move them towards risk base, trying to, to, to explain that, especially for small business enterprises, you don't need to control everything. So this is where we left. We, we, we tried to create a series of, of, of guidelines, a series of workshops, a series of, of manuals, a series of, of formats for licenses, and some ministries have started to, to, to move towards that. And in particular, to, to try to control their operating licenses and re realizing that licenses are really not required when you are so small. Licenses should be only trying to control market failures for consumers, for the environment, for other firms, etc. We believe that this is a very important work still needs to be done, but I think for, in terms of COVID, in terms of, of what is really now the urgency in a country like Laos, but it, again, it could be also in, uh, in, 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 uh, in some uh, islands in the Philippines or, in, or, or Indonesia or, or other parts at local level, I think something else needed. And here is really what we, we believe the, the next perhaps reform that we have been pushing in Laos, but elsewhere too. It is basically trying to, to, to develop some sort of one-stop shop, as Rosanna said, I think this is the, the needed is to try to, to have everything, registration and operation licensing in a single place, especially for small, micro, 
medium and of course importantly informal economies, but trying to move it towards something much more in terms of trust, but verify approach instead of command and let you work. Having this basically one-stop shop where you will start to provide registration firms very a registry as a birth certificate very quickly, again, for small, medium, I'm not talking about multinationals, I'm not talking here about very complex uh, company structures. Checking in the one-stop shop, if the applicant wants to develop some, some risky activity, and if not, trying to get rapidly a certificate to start, avoiding the whole operating licenses. And sorry, uh, Cesar, sorry if I interrupt you. Uh, you have already exceeded your- I'm gonna finish, this is my last. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> and if, it, if, if this activity is risky, then go through the process. But trying to do, as in Mexico, a Mexican scheme exists already this way, you can really formalize many firms and you can really open up activity for many. Of course, all with a better inspection exposed, a very better verification later. That is all, and I'm sorry, I, I went a little bit too long. That's it, thank you. Thank you, Cesar. I find this experience in Laos very interesting, in particular linking together business registration and licensing. And I and I actually apologize if, the, if, if we had to, you know, call you a time. Uh, it, it's really I understand it's really difficult to uh, keep yeah, such a, a varied <laughs> experience uh, in 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 twelve minutes. Um, last but not least, uh, our last panelist for this uh, opening panel is Professor Gen Goto. Um, Gen is a professor at the um, University of Tokyo and is uh, Japan's delegate to Working Group One since the very beginning of the Working Group. He will present the Japanese approach to MSME registration. And I hope that given his knowledge of the texts prepared by the working group, that will be put in the context of the UNCITRA legislative guide on key principles of a business registry. Uh, again, the floor is all yours. Uh, thank you, Monica, uh, for this kind introduction and uh, uh, good evening and good afternoon, good morning to everyone. Uh, so. Uh, it is my great pleasure and honor to uh, present, uh, have this short speech at this Incheon Law and Business Forum and uh, talk about Japanese experience. So let me just pull up my slides now. Okay, so I hope this is working. Okay, so. Okay, so uh, let me begin with a brief overview of uh, MSMEs in Japan. Uh, the point I would like to emphasize here is that there are multiple legal forms, just like in other jurisdictions, that uh, MSMEs can take in Japan. So you can start your business as an individual, uh, or you can set up a company uh, just by yourself alone, or with your friends and families. And there are two types of companies that are commonly used uh, by MSMEs, uh, which are Japanese LLC, uh, we call this Godo Kaisha or GK, and also Stock Corporation, or in Japanese Kabushiki Kaisha or KK. And this uh, Japanese LLC is a form modeled, uh, not surprisingly, surprisingly, on US uh, limited liability corporations. And uh, this is getting traction uh, since its uh, introduction in 2005. However, uh, the more popular form uh, for uh, MSMEs uh, is actually stock corporation, which is also the form used by listed companies. So uh, Japanese Companies Act, uh, provides a uh, special set of rules uh, that can be used by closely held uh, stock corporations. So you can see from this table that actually the vast majority of stock corporations in Japan, uh, over 2.5 million, are actually closely held corporations. And uh, most of them are uh, medium sized or small sized enterprises. And uh, if you are to set up an LLC, 
or stock corporation in Japan, uh, then uh, you must go to a commercial registry office. Uh, because registration uh, is necessary uh, for obtaining a judicial personality and also uh, limited liability here. But in contrast, uh, if you are pursuing your business as an individual, then um, it is not required uh, to register. So of course, you need to notify the tax office that you are uh, running a business and you also need to file tax reports uh, that uh, your income uh, is from your business. However, uh, it is perfectly legal uh, to uh, do business uh, without uh, commercial registration. So uh, Madam Secretary uh, noted in her um, keynote speech that uh, Anstro's uh, working group one's focus was on a poetry on the transition of MSMEs from the so-called informal economy to the formal economy. So I believe that this is a very important aspect and uh, which also Mr. Kozova uh, talked about Lao's experience. So uh, to have MSMEs in uh, developed, uh, developing countries uh, to, into the formal economy. However, um, in Japan, uh, this is not the uh, concern because um, in Japan, uh, individual entrepreneurs, uh, even without registration, they are also in the formal economy. In other words, uh, most individual entrepreneurs in Japan are recognized by the tax authority. So this is uh, more about how to uh, enforce the tax law. And uh, this is something other than the registry system. However, uh, having said that, I would also like to note that uh, actually many MSMEs in Japan uh, do register as either as uh, Japanese LLCs or stock corporations in order to obtain limited liability, tax benefits, or better access to bank finance. Uh, all of them are attached uh, in some cases legally, or in some cases just uh, by de facto, they are attached to uh, being a corporation. So, and also uh, the Japanese government uh, for this one or two decades, uh, it has been uh, emphasizing promotion of entrepreneurship is very important uh, to revitalize Japanese economy. So these two uh, aspects makes uh, efficiency of business, business registry system are also a very important uh, issue uh, in Japan as well, not only in uh, developing countries. So uh, what uh, we have done so far on business registration process. So first of all, uh, Japan has uh, worked on online application and also one-stop shop application procedure. So, uh, I believe uh, it was Ms. Uh, Bell uh, who noted uh, this point uh, regarding Australia, but this is one of the core recommendation of the Anstro Registrative Guide on uh, Business Registry. So uh, with this online one-stop shop, um, it, you can have very efficient uh, system and the applicants uh, do only need to do just one click. Uh, he or she doesn't need to uh, visit many agencies and submit similar papers, but just with smaller modifications. And, uh, and this can avoid uh, many errors and uh, time-taking procedures. So in Japan, uh, this project uh, for online one-stop shop applications started in 2018. And uh, in, uh, from 2020, January, uh, we now have a full operation of this one-stop shop system. Uh, we use national ID number system for individuals uh, covering social security and tax uh, issues. And uh, this number is also issued to non-Japanese uh, residents in Japan. So uh, if you have this number, you can apply uh, for this uh, one-stop shop online application, which covers uh, business registry, uh, taxation, both national and local, uh, social security agency, and uh, labor and employment agency. So uh, it was very lucky for Japan that uh, this um, online application started uh, just before the COVID-19 hit Japan uh, very hard. Uh, also, um, 
we have worked on shortening the period uh, necessary for registration. So before 2018, it took around seven days uh, to register a company. Now, uh, since March 2020, uh, if you are doing full online application, and if you're a small farm uh, with five or less uh, directors, um, you can have your business registered within 24 hours. Unfortunately, not like in minutes, <laughs> uh, like in Australia or perhaps in somewhere, some states in the United States, but uh, from seven days to one day um, is a big difference uh, for uh, ent entrepreneurs. And the reason that why we cannot register a business in minutes is because uh, in Jap Japanese law requires officers of registry to do some review on, uh, on the uh, application. But uh, this review is, uh, we call this formalistic review uh, because the officers will just check uh, whether all the documents are submitted or uh, whether all the fields are filled in uh, appropriately and uh, are there uh, efficient evidence uh, is attached. And the point is that uh, the officers would not go, in, go into the substance um, of, the, of the documents. So uh, if you start doing this, it would take a lot of time, but uh, just checking um, whether the, all the documents are fine um, could be um, easily done, especially uh, if the application is done fully online. So uh, these are uh, the Japan's uh, efforts on business registration process reform. And I believe it could be said that uh, efficiency uh, has improved very much uh, in Japan. But at, at the same time, uh, Japanese law also takes uh, the prevention of uh, misuse of corporate forms uh, very seriously. So uh, we require uh, applicants uh, or if you are to establish a stock corporation, uh, you are required to submit a list of founders. And uh, this is not uh, required to update, so you don't need to um, file every time your shareholders change. But uh, we think it is very important uh, to see who founded uh, that corporation in the outset. And uh, so you can track uh, who was the man behind the scenes. And another thing uh, that a Japanese law requires is the notarization of articles of incorporation. So public notaries uh, will check the articles of incorporation and uh, to see whether uh, it is drafted uh, in compliance with our Companies Act. However, uh, this is a time-taking procedure. So uh, this requirement scope is quite limited. Uh, we require this only for establishing a stock corporation and not, on, not for uh, LLCs. The idea is that uh, if you have a stock corporation, uh, there is a larger chance of uh, having uh, shareholders tr transfer their shares. So uh, the idea is that uh, is, this should be required. But uh, personally, uh, I'm a little skeptic, skeptic whether this is really uh, necessary, as uh, if, this, if it is about uh, checking whether the drafting of uh, articles of incorporation is perfectly legal, uh, perhaps we can resort to some artificial in intelligence checking, uh, checking the formats. And uh, one uh, attempt by Japanese government is at least to do this uh, notarization uh, by online meetings uh, to speed up the process. So anyway, um, we have done a series of things. And uh, I believe that this can be seen as one example of how to balance efficient and speedy registration, uh, which is very important for promoting entrepreneurship, and also uh, prevention of flaws or misuse of corporate forms. In, uh, in the working group one of the ANSTRO, uh, we had a long discussion on how to balance these two uh, concepts. And in the end, uh, the delegations decided that it was too difficult to uh, have a single solution because there are so many uh, divergent approaches uh, among us. So uh, actually the legislative guide on business registry uh, leaves uh, leaves it to the states how to balance uh, these two issues, which is not actually an easy task. So um, 
I hope that uh, this Japanese experience or Japanese approach uh, might be uh, beneficial as some uh, benchmark or uh, some solution, some idea to those states who are uh, thinking of uh, implementing uh, the legislative guide. Thank you so much. Thank you again uh, for uh, providing these snapshots of the uh, um, Japanese approach to business registration and also uh, to connect it to the legislative guide. Uh, and this has also been a very nice way to summarize uh, uh, some of the uh, issues that uh, we and aspects that we have heard also from the other uh, speakers, from Roseanne and from Caesar. Um, I would ask Caesar to turn out live for the, uh, because we will use this opportunity to take a, a group uh, photo for this panel, but also I need some guidance from our colleagues in RCAP. Uh, do I have, uh, is there any time for two or three questions from the audience or shall we uh, move on to the, to the break? Kind for, uh, thank, thank you Atita or thank you Ionian for, for guiding me. Uh, can I can can we just ask one or two questions for the from the audience? Hi Monica. So one question, please. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So is there uh, um, any any questions uh, otherwise? Um, okay, then I have um, one question that we've received, which is, uh, if any entrepreneur would like to start business globally, what formality him or her will have to do? Uh, I think that we have four examples here uh, from Laos, Australia, uh, three examples, sorry, and, and, uh, and uh, Japan. Um, any any of you would like to take up these questions and try to more or less summarize what would be a global <laughs> an answer that can capture every more or less the main trends? Okay, I'm so, happy. Uh, oh, oh, please oh, go ahead. Oh. No, no, please go ahead. Please. I'll start, I'll, I'll make a start okay. and then maybe yeah. you could okay. follow. I was just going to say, if you want to run a business globally, you would need at the moment, unfortunately, to do registrations more or less in every country that you wish to do business in. However, increasingly over time, jurisdictions globally are looking at ways that they can align their legislation and processes to make it easier to do international trade. Um, but unfortunately, there's quite a long way to go on that front. Thank you, Roseanne, again. Okay, yeah, yes. So uh, I, I agree with Roseanne that uh, unfortunately uh, the world is not that simple yet. Uh, but I th at least you need to, um, you would need to establish your company somewhere in the world, in hope, uh, mostly in your home jurisdiction. And uh, for example, if you are to come from your home jurisdiction to Japan, then uh, Japanese law would not require you to establish another company in Japan, but uh, you'd be required to register as a foreign company in which that you, you don't need to go through all the formalities, but uh, for example, to have some contact point in Japan um, so that uh, if any creditors or your trade partners in Japan have any claim against you, that uh, so they know where to go or how to file a lawsuit. And um, for several time uh, period, uh, you are required to have some physical um, office or facility. Uh, but in today's world, uh, more and more uh, the presence of a physical facility is um, becoming less important. So. Um, in hopefully in not so far future, uh, that could change. And if once, if this becomes, um, you know, a fully digitalized world, then um, it will be much easier. And uh, if you are following uh, this Anstrel's uh, LLE, uh, which is the subject <laughs> of the uh, next session, uh, that could be one solution because it could be easily recognized by uh, other jurisdictions as well. Thank you. 
thank you again. Uh, then thank you uh, to the three. I think it's time that we uh, actually bring the first panel to an end. We have already um, it, we have already eroded a little bit of the time of the of the break. I would like to thank again uh, Caesar, Roseanne, and Gen for their uh, contributions. If there are additional and further questions, uh, I'm sure that. Atita, Eun Yang, and uh, um, Jenny, our colleagues from the Art Cup, will um, forward them to you. And I'm now giving the floor back to Eun Yang for the next step of this. Good morning. Meeting. May I remind you of the group capture for your panel? Yes, please. Tell us what we have to do for the group capture, please. Okay, we will take group capture. So please be ready and smile. Yes, it's done. Thank you very much. Thanks to you. And um, so uh, back to you actually again as a master of ceremony. Thank you, Monica, and all speakers for the excellent discussion. We will now have a five minute break. Welcome back to our second panel of day one. We examine another aspect of MSME formation. Panel two will discuss the newly adopted UNCITRA legislative guide on limited liability enterprises. It's my pleasure to welcome back Ms. Monica Kanafulia, Legal Officer, UNCITRA as moderator. As noted, Monica's details and all panelists' information can be found on the event webpage. I now pass the floor to Monica again, please. Thank you, Wenyang. I hope you can, I have some technical issues. I hope you can hear me recently with not too much noise or echoing. Um, very, uh, as I said at the very beginning, um, and the second panel of this morning is also based on the background uh, uh, text uh, prepared by UNCITRA Working Group 1 that um, was uh, adopted by the Commission last Summer um, and it's the legislative, the UNCITRA legislative guide on um, limited liability enterprises on LLE. And um, this um, the text um, as the as the previous as the, the text on legislative uh, and the text on business registration is based on best practices from around the world uh, that states in different countries, in different regions, at different level of uh, economic development uh, have adopted to simplify establishment of MSMEs. And in order to make it easier and to facilitate their formalization, and also to make it easier for the uh, entrepreneurs to run their businesses. Um, the panel, I've asked the panelists, uh, and I will introduce them uh, one by one as they have their presentation. Um, the panelists will uh, um, provide a snapshot. Uh, I've asked the panelists to provide a snapshot of legal issues of MSMEs and as much as possible to contextualize that in the within the, 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 the principles of the legislative guide. The first panelist is Dr. Anne Matthew. She is a senior lecturer at Queensland, <coughs> excuse me, Queensland University of Technology Law School in Australia. And she's also representative of the Law Asia in Working Group 1. And she will open the panel with an overview of MSME in Asia Pacific, uh, in the Asia Pacific region. Uh, and the floor is yours. Well, thank you, Monica. Oh, well, hello everyone from um, Brisbane in Australia, and thank you very much to um, Monica for asking me to specifically address the Pacific region. 
Uh, all nations in this region could stand to benefit from the consideration of the LLE, uh, even where their corporate law already accommodates MSMEs by allowing them to form single person limited liability companies. So let me explain how I come to this view. Well, firstly, it's important to acknowledge that the Pacific region is quite diverse and it's characterised by this preponderance of small island states. So any reflection upon the merits of law reform in this region is going to take place against the backdrop of a, a business and trade environment that's already dealing with risks associated with the climate emergency, keeping pace with technological advances and their remoteness. So small island states in particular may desire additional support when it comes to navigating the LLE. The company and trade law in this region is at various stages of development and modernisation. And in many Pacific nations, corporate law tends to be predominantly one size fits all with accommodations for one person companies. Even then, the complexity of the law can still be unwarranted for MSMEs. MSMEs in the Pacific region appear to mostly trade as sole traders, partnerships or limited liability companies. In some Pacific nations where MSEs form as a company, they tend to dominate the company landscape. Sometimes they make up 99% of all companies. Yet, despite the range of business forms an MSME can take in the Pacific region, sole traders make up to 80% of all MSME businesses. For example, in Australia, where one-person companies can be formed, there is nonetheless a strengthening preference for forming as a sole trader. So policymakers should think about why this is so, because this could be the space for LLEs to inhabit. As a general guide to the issues for MSMEs in the Pacific region, consideration could be given to simplification of law and registration processes, the influence of other law upon choice of business form, addressing regulatory burden and modernisation of law, even where single person companies can already be formed. So take, for example, simplification of law and registration processes. The World Bank's analysis on ease of doing business indicates that the average duration of business registration processes in the Pacific vary from same day to 28 days. Indeed, the world's fastest process with the fewest steps is found in New Zealand, but some other Pacific nations have among the slowest processes for business registration. So the legislative guide on key principles of a business registry may be very useful here, but so too will the legislative guide for the LLE. For example, in some Pacific nations, registration requirements include lodgement of the company's organisational rules. So the LLE, with its mixture of mandatory and adaptable organisational rules, may remove a key hurdle here for nascent business. The Legislative Guide for LLEs recommends against minimum capital requirements and offers quite a detailed explanation as to why this is the case. And some Pacific nations, particularly Oh, well, for example, Palau, do have minimum capital requirements. The LLE offers pause for thought here as to the merits of that approach relative to encouraging more MSMEs to join the formal economy. Uh, one of our earlier speakers mentioned that key drivers for forming a limited liability company are access to separate legal personality and limited liability. The LLE features both of these. It accommodates growth and legitimises the business in a way that might assist in navigating access to finance, for example. But other law does have potential to be a very powerful influence on choice of business form. 
So, for example, a nascent business unsure of its potential success might be more likely to take a form initially as a sole trader because, for example, it could allow them access to a lower tax rate as an individual and even avoid the very minimal reporting requirements imposed on small private companies. The corporate tax rates vary so wildly in the Pacific region that this could be an influence on why so many MSMEs here form as sole traders. This could be a space too for the LLEs to inhabit. No legal form should be introduced without considering the regulatory issues and whether the LLE could sit alongside existing business forms or simply offer opportunity to improve those already available should be considered. Policymakers might want to consider whether or not they should also introduce mechanisms for existing limited liability companies to convert to an LLE. And importantly, the introduction of the LLE among Pacific nations might occasion a rethink of the merits of a one-size-fits-all regulatory approach. There could be scope here for dedicated regulatory regimes for MSMEs with a focus on fitness for purpose, simplification, reducing red tape, incentives and support for entrepreneur-led recovery, MSMEs as incubators for new employment opportunities and support also for MSME innovation. And finally, considering the LLE might prompt modernisation of law, for example, by encouraging the disputes that concern governance or operation of the LLE to be resolved by alternative dispute resolution, as many Pacific nations have moved in recent years to improve their ADR environment, this would be a particularly fitting development for MSMEs to keep pace with their existing regulatory agendas in the Pacific region. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, can, I hope you can hear me. Um, keep having, I'm sorry, keep having technical issues. Thank you, Anne, for the uh, overview of the Pacific region and the correlation to the uh, legislative guide uh, uh, on LME. Um, next um, speaker is uh, Mr. Uh, Yang Bing Chun um, from the Department of Treaty and Law, Ministry of Commerce in China and is also a delegate uh, to the working group, uh, the working group one at its uh, 35th session. His presentation will focus on uh, legal issues on MSMEs in uh, China. Uh, the floor is yours, Mr. Yang. Thank you, uh, Ms. Kanafoglia. And, uh, uh, Hello to all the participants online. Good afternoon. It, it is my honor to participate in the forum and join the panel too, as one speaker. I'm from the Ministry of Commerce, uh, China. Uh, I'd like to share some information of China's experience and the laws on MSMEs. Uh, now I will share my uh, slides. My introduction is divided into four parts. Uh, first, um, what are MSMEs in China? And second, how are MSMEs uh, developing? The third, laws on MSMEs. And uh, third, some legal issues. Uh, actually, I would like to make some comparison between the uh, legislative guide LRE and uh, some rules uh, in China. In China, we have very clear criteria to classify the uh, enterprises. I think it is uh, similar to the chart provided by Ms. Gen, but a little bit uh, complicated. Um, the criteria for the classification of enterprises uh, are with some indicators include the total business income, capital, and the number of employees. And in light of different industry categories, 
for example, we can see from the data table, uh, if there are 20 people working in a wholesale company, it is a medium-sized enterprise. Well, if uh, there are 20 people working in a, a company in estate management uh, sector, uh, the company is just a micro enterprise. Uh, recently, the criteria have been considered to amend. Some categories are uh, considered to merge. Another change is to increase some uh, threshold, which means more enterprises will be classified into smaller enterprises. Um, how are MSMEs developing in China? I think they are quite important and uh, active. Here is some number. According to the report of the uh, National Bureau of Statistics in 2019, by the end of 2018, China has uh, 18 million MSMEs. Uh, okay, here the number is just referred to the legal persons. Uh, it, it was an increase um, of about, uh, uh, it, it was increased by 115% over the end of 2013. And uh, they account for more than 99% of all market entities. Among them, as the chart uh, demonstrates, uh, micro enterprises uh, can be uh, more than 80%. And this chart shows the uh, MSMEs are crucially important, either from the viewpoint of employment or from the viewpoint of revenue. We can see the number, uh, the proportion is quite big. A third part, the laws. Uh, I'll give you a brief picture of the laws on MSMEs. Uh, besides the constitution, there are four uh, layer of four parts of uh, laws and regulations in China. Uh, first, uh, the laws uh, made by National People's Congress, and second, uh, regulations uh, made by the State Council, and then administrative rules by ministries and departments, and then the regional ordinances by the provincial areas. So here we got the uh, rules on MSMEs in China. Um, we could say China has a mature legal system in the promotion of MSMEs. Uh, the laws on promotion of MSMEs um, and also as to the types of, uh, okay. Uh, as to the types of formation of MSMEs, we need to check the company law, partnership law, individual proprietorship law. Um, and uh, uh, as to the uh, regulations of the state council, here we see the regulation of ensuring the payment to MSMEs, uh, guidelines on promoting the healthy development of MSMEs and further support measures, regulations on the administrative of registration of market entities, regulations on improving the business environment. For the last two regulations, they are not merely uh, for the MSMEs, but they impose a very active positive impact to the MSMEs, especially regarding the registration. And here we got laws, uh, the, uh, rules from the ministries and the departments. Um, there are some rules from the Ministry of Finance, Ministry of uh, Industry and uh, Information Technology, Ministry of Science and Technology, and also uh, Banking and Insurance Regulatory Commission. <clears throat> so, uh, so many departments are involved 
and make a joint effort to push the MSMEs. And also the regional governments and the local people's Congress attach high concern to the MSMEs. You may find the local ordinances on the promotion of MSMEs in all the 34 provincial areas in China. Okay. Now, I uh, would like to focus on some legal issues by comparison uh, between the laws in China and the uh, legis uh, legislative guide on RLE. Uh, I picked up some illegal issues, uh, including the legal personal personality, limited liability, minimum capital requirement, enterprise management, registration, and other issues. In China, we can see uh, there are several um, types of uh, business uh, organizations which could be registered in China. The so company partnership, individual proprietorship, and individual business operator. Um, they're all possible to uh, regis uh, register for MSMEs. Actually, the individual business operator is just a natural person, individual person or individual families. They cannot uh, be called uh, the enterprise, but other th three kinds are all enterprises. First, for legal personality, um, the uh, legislative guide of RRE uh, said the law should provide that the UNLAW uh, has a legal personality distinct from its members. And in China, if um, an um, organization uh, would like to get the legal personality, he could um, only, I think, uh, for the MSMEs, only to register as a company. Only the company uh, has a legal person. Uh, usually, other types of enterprises in China do not have legal personalities, except for some uh, non-company SOEs and the previous um, contractual joint venture enterprises. But now um, the contractual joint venture enterprise has ceased. Uh, all of this kind of organizations should be registered as a company. The second is limited liability. Um, the recommendation that um, the UNLO has uh, limited li liability. And in China, um, uh, there is, uh, if uh, you register as a company or register as, um, as a limited uh, partnership, the limited partner, the limited partner, yeah, limited partnership could enjoy the uh, limited liability uh, besides uh, shareholder in your company. And also here I want to emphasize uh, in the Chinese company law, there is also this, uh, one person limited liability company type. So uh, if a sole investor could uh, sh enjoy the limited liability, you know, one person limited uh, liability company. Uh, the contribution or minimum capital issue. Uh, in the legislation, uh, legislative guide, um, it said the law should not require a minimum capital for the formation of an unlaw. And also the law should establish that members may agree uh, in the organization rules on the type, timing and value of their contributions. Well, here I, uh, I'd like to uh, share the, uh, and the history of uh, China's uh, company law, some, especially some amendment. And the law was adopted in 1993. And in uh, 2013, it, uh, uh, there was a, a big amendment. And before that amendment, the uh, law required paid in uh, contribution and with a uh, minimum capital for uh, cans, uh, all kinds of um, companies. After that amendment, um, the new law said uh, the registered capital of a limited liability co uh, company 
shall be the amount of capital contributions subscribed by all the shareholders. And the new law deleted the requirement of the minimum capital. So I think it's a great change and progress. And actually, the two kinds of uh, rules, they are in the same direction. And uh, enterprise management. Um, in, in, the, in the legislative guide from recommendation 11 to 16, here um, it uh, provided with um, a flexible enterprise management. Um, it guarantee the uh, entrepreneurs to manage their enterprise more equally and they could decide or uh, more uh, democratically, uh, either uh, any um, entrepreneur or any member of the uh, MSME could enjoy uh, the equal um, right to manage their enterprise. Well, we see the similar rules in Chinese partnership enterprise law, like in the Article 26, Article 30. Mm -hmm. Mr. Bingston, sorry to interrupt you. Uh, you have already exceeded your um, your time. If you could come to a conclusion of your presentation, thank you. Okay. Okay. Here. Uh, um, okay. The last uh, is uh, registration. Uh, in China, we also have the one-stop uh, shop um, public service. We call it One Web All Down. And, and we uh, have a very splendid um, experience. Now the law set the time for uh, registration of uh, enterprise uh, limited to three days. And also other issues uh, since the time, uh, I, I will ignore them. Here is not a conclusion, I think. Uh, we have the uh, traditional laws, the company law, partnership law, they prepared for the base of our uh, <clears throat> thinking and uh, study. And the Ancestral uh, uh, RLE, is, it makes a combination of existing rules. And also, I think it's a very perfect gift for MSMEs. I hope uh, the organization rules in the future could be more flexible internally and higher efficiency externally with lower cost for investors. Thanks for listening. Um, and, and thank you for, for bearing uh, with me uh, and, uh, um, and, and my request uh, and, and my comment that, that the presentation was kind of exceeding uh, the allotted time. I found it very interesting and especially a thank you for the parallelism between the, uh, the legal aspects of Chinese law and the ultra legislative guide uh, on uh, limited liability enterprises. We are now moving to West, uh, slowly to West. We've been in the Asia Pacific region for quite a while. And uh, the next uh, uh, um, expert is Professor Sinisa Petrovic. He's uh, a professor at the Faculty of Law, University of Zagreb, Croatia. He's also a delegate, a long time delegate to Working Group One, and um, he will uh, look into a uh, company law approaches for MSMEs and whether the UNCITAL LLE can provide a, a, a good uh, approach, a good solution for that. Finish the floor is yours. Thank you. Hello. Uh, thank you very much, Monica. Um, uh, good morning, good afternoon, and very good morning to Sharla, who is still would have been sleeping in, under normal conditions. Very sorry not to be in Incheon in person. I guess everybody thinks the same. In the 10 minutes uh, which I have, I intend uh, nevertheless to uh, cover 
like five uh, important topics. I would start with the global context, then move to the European or European Union context. Uh, try to tell you something about the European experience, uh, then go from uh, regional to again a global situation, ancestralian experience within the working group. And finally, in uh, just briefly, I will tell you what I think is the future and how I see the LLE and the contribution and the work of ancestral in the context of the MSMEs. First, as to the global context, uh, I would like to emphasize basically what I say is a kind of paradox. Uh, namely, never before have we, have we be having uh, businesses operating so globally, so extensively, yet, on one hand, the uh, regulation which is necessary for the protection of all the persons involved uh, proved sometimes to be excessive. I think we can all agree that overregulation is never good, and overregulation is especially burdensome to small and medium sized enterprises. Uh, I'm not saying that every regulation is bad, nor that it is uh, unnecessary. I'm just saying that it is burdensome to the MSMEs. Second paradox, which I think we face is that uh, if we look into the history of company law and development of various companies, now, uh, I mean by that modern type companies. So let's say starting with the East uh, India Corporation and uh, Dutch East India Corporation, and then moving to the LLSC and the, so to say artificial, initially artificial development in Germany in the late uh, 19th century. Uh, the fact, of life is that there is not uh, a common, fully compatible in all jurisdictions, any legal form. We may have Jones Tech corporations, we may have limited liability companies, we may have partnership in various jurisdictions, but it is impossible to say that uh, uh, the internal organization and rules of one company, of one legal form, is completely the same in any other jurisdiction. That uh, actually means that uh, what was also questioned in the previous panel as to the registration and how to approach it, whether you have to register in every ju jurisdiction means even more. You have to know, or at least be acquainted to some certain extent with all the rules, internal organization and external organization rules and uh, business uh, of uh, um, every company in every jurisdiction where you would like to do business. Uh, that in my view is a paradox, especially bearing in mind the fact that uh, businesses have never been so global and uh, uh, um, this cosmopolitan approach has never been uh, deeper than it is today. In the context of the uh, European Union, or better to say Europe, uh, that is uh, uh, especially visible, uh, notably this paradox. Although 27 EU member states, plus all the states we have, which have uh, in Europe, which have some kind of uh, uh, contractual or deeper economic ties with the European Union, which means basically 90% of the European countries uh, face the same situation. So even though there are rules on free movement of goods, of capital, of services, 
of uh, uh, right of establishment. There are no, with only two exceptions, but in practical terms, uh, unimportant exceptions, there are no commonly known legal forms for all the European Union states. These two examples or uh, exceptions are European Joint Stock Corporation and European Economic Interest Grouping, which in practice have proved not to be neither attractive to entrepreneurs nor successful. That also means that uh, um, by default, uh, closer economic ties or even political ties are no, um, no uh, uh, proof or no uh, guarantee that common legal forms might be possible. Uh, when we move now into the, uh, at the same time, uh, uh, again to the situation with the Ancitral, I personally, as the uh, Croatian delegate in the working group one, really sincerely saw the work of Ancitral as an opportunity to come up with the globally known recognized legal form, which would be not only uh, attractive, but also in principle known to all the entrepreneurs and to in every legal system. In that sense, I really believe that limited liability enterprise is something which is uh, 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 being simple or attempting to be simple, uh, uh, having the uh, acquiring the common principles of MSMEs, notably by that I mean legal personality, no obligation of capital contribution, so no uh, share capital, still protection of shareholders, protection of the company protection of the creditors is definitely means to move forward. And I think uh, in that sense, uh, I really praise the work of Ancitral in that respect to be uh, quite, I saw it a lot of time is up, so just 30 seconds more, please. Uh, in that sense, uh, I must say that uh, I personally uh, would have preferred some other options, uh, and I will openly say uh, that is to who may be the shareholder, so why also legal entities. Uh, secondly, uh, that is the limited liability enterprise. I believe, knowing all the intellectual property restrictions, that uh, but I would have preferred to have the some kind of name uh, indicating uh, involvement of Ancitral in it. Nevertheless, in spite of all the uh, efforts which we have to achieve, as it is always in Antitral, to reach compromises on various issues, I really believe that uh, LLE is the right track and uh, right uh, uh, path for every UN uh, member state, how to not only improve, but implement in their national legislations something which would be well recognized by all the nations. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sinister, for this uh, snapshot that went from the bigger picture and to smaller, smaller boxes, and also for your support to the LLE. I, I know I uh, well remember that uh, you would have uh, probably done something different, uh, but I recognize your great art of compromising. And we, we now move uh, uh, further west. Uh, again, from from uh, from Croatia, from Europe, we are moving to the United States. Um, I also uh, would like to thank um, Ms. Sharla Draman, who is the uh, attorney advisor at the Office of Private International Law, Office of the Legal Advisor, U.S. Department of State, 
for uh, um, getting up so early in the morning to uh, to share with uh, uh, us the uh, uh, U.S. experience on legal forms to support MSMEs. Um, Sharla is also uh, the United States delegate to Working Group One. I leave the floor to her. Uh, Sharla, please, it's all uh, yours. Um, please, Sharla, unmute yourself. Sorry. Apologies. Everyone can no hear me now? Yeah. Yes, okay. Thank you. Okay, great. Let me just go back. Uh, thank you, Monica. And uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone. Um, uh, delighted to be here today, uh, despite the early hour. Uh, as Monica noted, I served as the U.S. delegate for the Uncitral Working Group that negotiated the new LLE guide. And so while I'll mostly focus my discussion on legal parallels between the Uncitral LLE and U.S. limited liability companies or LLCs, as well as some general LLC practice in the United States, I thought I'd start just by highlighting a basic point. Why, why did we care about this? I think the short answer is that we believe in the importance of small business as a driver for employment, innovation, and trade and that developing and promoting this legal form, among others, will encourage small businesses to grow, uh, to form and grow and benefit the global economy. Just as in so many other economies, small businesses are essential to US economic success. In 2017, United States small businesses employed 60.6 .6 million people or 47% of the private workforce. In 2018, 97% of the firms that exported goods from the United States were small businesses, and they generated 32% of the United States' 1.5 trillion in total exports. It is impossible to imagine this level of success for small business without the underlying legal structures that enable them to thrive. We therefore believe in the value of promoting the development of an enabling legal environment. And while the LLC is only part of that environment in the US, it is an important one. And of course, the one we're here to discuss today. In the United States, the first LLC statute was created in 1977 and all 50 states had an LLC statute by 1996. After nearly 45 years of existence, the US has developed a wealth of practice and experience in the law and practical operation of limited liability companies. The LLC has grown to become one of the most prevalent business forms in the United States. Due to this long history, as well as to the success of LLCs in the US, we were able to share with the working group many principles of US LLC law, as well as lessons learned. For example, in earlier practice in the United States, statutes generally required two or more members to form an LLC under a contract theory. As time progressed, however, the value of the LLC to small and micro businesses became more apparent. And now all 50 states permit single member LLCs. LLCs have become very popular with sole owners because of the simplified business structure and flexibility. The LLE guide, the Uncitral guide, which is specifically focused on assisting micro, small and medium sized enterprises has similarly embraced permitting single member LLEs. As you may have already picked up by my references to US states, LLCs in the United States are a creature of state law. There is no federal LLC statute governing their operations. As a result, there is a fair amount of diversity in LLC law. However, significant efforts at harmonization have been made in the United States including through the development of a Uniform Limited Liability Company Act in 1996 and revised Uniform Limited Liability Company Act in 2006. Many states adopted these uniform acts, resulting in increased harmonization throughout the country over time. This harmonization has obvious benefits for businesses and trade, as it makes it easier for the many economic actors to understand how to structure their behavior without requiring as much state-by-state -state analysis. 
The premise of Unstral, of course, is that international trade will similarly benefit by such harmonization, which the legislative guide obviously hopes to encourage. All U.S. LLC statutes, of course, respect certain basic principles, which have also been incorporated into the Unsatral LLE guide. Most fundamentally, and as has already been noted, LLCs protect you from personal liability so that your personal assets, like your vehicle or house and personal savings, will generally not be at risk if your LLC faces bankruptcy or lawsuits. This protection of personal assets is an obvious benefit to entrepreneurs and small businesses, allowing them to take chances on new enterprises without risking, for example, losing their family's home. LLCs are also subject to fewer reporting requirements and fewer regulations regarding their governance and tr than traditional corporations. LLCs are able to form and operate, for example, without formal officers, annual meetings, or complex company record keeping. One important feature in both U.S. statutes and the UNCITRAL guide is the provision of a series of default rules for how the LLC is governed, unless the members agree otherwise in an operating agreement. The drafters of the first uniform law on LLCs in the United States expressly recognize the importance of this feature for small businesses, specifically that small entrepreneurs without the benefit of counsel should be able to easily access the legal form. As such, the uniform law set forth default rules designed to operate without sophisticated agreements and to recognize that members may also modify these rules through contract. The Unstral LLE guide embraces both this simplified system of default rules as well as broad contractual freedom to deviate from many of those rules, which has made the LLC such a useful, flexible form in the US. As one very important example, the LLE guide establishes a default rule that members of the LLE have equal rights in it regardless of their contributions. This default was chosen to provide the simplest governance and distribution structure suited for small businesses. We would expect in many cases that members will alter this default rule to recognize that they have made significantly unequal contributions, financially or otherwise, and that benefits will not flow equally as a result. However, if they simply begin operating without discussion or decisions on this matter, a statute based on the LLE guide would provide the requisite governing rule. The Unsatral LLE guide is a helpful resource for any legislator or regulator interested in incorporating an MSME-friendly business form into their legal system. It does not provide every answer, however, nor can it stand entirely alone. For example, delegates were unable to reach consensus on certain matters, such as what form the organizational rules should take, if any, and whether legal persons should be permitted to be members. There is relatively extensive discussion in the guide elaborating pros and cons of the different possible choices. Users of the guide seeking to develop a statute will need to make drafting decisions for these and other matters based on their country's specific circumstances. It may be helpful to see how other countries have enacted statutes covering these topics. Though I've already noted there's no federal statute in the United States, the revised Uniform Limited Liability Company Act is freely available online and may serve as an example of how US states, at least, have addressed many of the recommendations in the guide. Finally, I think I must mention that another element that has been essential to LLC success in the US is their tax treatment. For LLCs, profits and losses can be passed through to members, or profits can be passed through to members as personal income without facing corporate taxation. Essentially, the LLC is not recognized as a separate business form for tax purposes, and instead is generally treated as a sole proprietorship or partnership as appropriate. The Unsatral Guide does not address taxation, of course, as that is outside the mandate of the organization but it is undeniable that LLCs would not have become as popular and successful in the United States if this tax treatment were not available. It is one of the integral features that an entrepreneur would consider when making the choice to establish his or her business as an LLC. I just make note of this because I would encourage anyone considering relying on the Unsatral Guide to also look into tax treatment options 
if they really want to encourage the endeavor to succeed. U.S. experience has demonstrated that simple limited liability business forms are extremely useful for those considering starting a small business. It is part of an overall MSME-friendly legal structure, infrastructure that Uncitral has been seeking to promote, along with providing for simplified business registration and helping to ensure access to credit, among other things. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Sharla. Uh, thank you for uh, this uh, very interesting, again, parallelism between the uh, legislation in the United States uh, and the legislative guide. And yes, we have appreciated the experience of the United States during the uh, many sessions that uh, the working group devoted to the uh, preparation of the legislative guide. Um, I, I know that uh, at the moment the allotted time for the hour panel is, uh, is over, so I will not ask any questions to all um, the experts. Uh, please, Mr. Bingston, could you please turn on your camera? We will use this uh, opportunity to go for a group photo. But I uh, would, um, uh, if there are questions uh, from the audience, uh, I would uh, ask my colleagues from the RCAP, uh, from RCAP uh, to uh, share the questions with you or, or address uh, or forward the questions to you so that you can um, answer the uh, answer to the, uh, to the various, um, uh, to those who are asking those questions. I would like to thank you again for um, accepting the invitation to uh, speak at the, at the forum. Uh, acknowledging again that Carla is four o'clock in the, in the morning, for, uh, sorry, uh, five o'clock in the morning in the US, and um, more certainly at more convenient time for the rest of us. Um, I would that. Uh, I will uh, see you soon in a different setting, uh, the four of you. And uh, without further ado, uh, I will leave the floor to um, Arkap. Uh, I don't know whether it's Akita or Onyang to guide us in the group uh, photo. Thanks, Monica and all the speakers. We already took group capture while Monica is speaking. <laughs> Okay. Thank you very much. And then the floor is back to you, Daniel Young, as the master of ceremony, uh, because I assume that the next panel is actually about to start. <laughs> Thank you very much again for the speakers on panel two. As we are now behind the schedule without break, let us now move on the round table discussion on MSME access to credit. We are very happy to have Ms. Astita Komendra, head of Oncitra Archive since 2019, moderate this round table. Astita has 20 years of experience in international trade and commerce law. Before joining Oncitra, Atita worked on multilateral dispute resolution, the rule of law, and access to justice for Thailand's commerce ministry and other agencies. She holds degrees from Harvard College and Georgetown and Harvard Law Schools. Atita, please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, and for the kind introduction. I hope you can see and hear me well. And apologies again to everyone for the technical difficulties we experienced during the first part of our first um, virtual Inch and Lawn Forum this year. And thank you again to joining. So hello from the Republic of Korea, where Ancetral RCAP, Ancetral's only regional center, has been situated since 2012. RCAP services approximately 60 jurisdictions in the Asia Pacific by providing capacity building to promote the progressive harmonization and modernization of international trade and commercial law, especially via the use, adoption, and uniform interpretation and application of UNCITRAL instruments. Although UNCITRAL has long recognized the need to promote the availability of credit at more affordable rates across national borders, to facilitate the cross-border movement of goods and services, 
and has developed several instruments to assist states in this regard, as will be shown in the chat box, MSMEs warrant special attention because of their small scale and low tolerance of risk. As UNCITRAL is commencing work on facilitating MSME access to credit, and because as a law-centric organization, it is not very often that we have the chance to connect with legal policy and business experts in one go, I am particularly excited about this round table, which will close today's um, first day of discussions. So to enliven the round table, it will be split into two segments. Our first three speakers, Ms. Diana Morris, Mr. Zandeep Varma, and Ms. Yangi, will each have five minutes, five minutes only, to help us understand the unique parameters of MSME financing by discussing foundational elements of and challenges to access to credit for MSMEs. If we have time, we would have a short Q&A of five minutes for the first three speakers and then turn to our remaining three speakers to present on new opportunities and innovations in MSME financing. We would then end the, selection, the session with a collective Q&A. Um, as our speakers are immensely qualified and I would not be able to do their bios justice in our 50 minutes, please visit the ILBF event webpage to learn more and we will put the link in the chat box. So our first panelist is Ms. Deanna Morris, who is Economic Affairs Officer at the United Nations Economic and Social Commission for Asia and the Pacific, or UNSCAP, in Bangkok, Thailand. Diana is kickstarting our discussions to provide the broader framework for MSME access to credit, as UNSCAP has comprehensive experience from the field. So, Diana, the next five minutes is yours, and the timekeeper will prompt you in the chat box when there is one minute remaining. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, good evening, and um, I'm Deanna Morris from United Nations SCAP. For those of you who aren't familiar with our work, we are the largest intergovernmental platform for the UN across Asia and the Pacific. And at SCAP, we're undertaking evidence-based research to support governments in their policy and regulatory decisions. Um, and we're working with financial service providers and fintechs to provide to support the development, testing, and scaling up of solutions for MSMEs to thrive. So just to provide a framing for the discussion, I'll start by giving some background on the financing gap for MSMEs in the region and challenges in accessing finance. For micro entrepreneurs, this gap is usually in the form of credit, while small and medium also have additional unmet financing needs, which go beyond credit. And this also includes other forms of investment, which such as venture capital and equity funding. In East Asia and the Pacific, the formal financing gap is estimated by the IFC at $2.3 trillion. Of this, um, enterprises owned by women make up 57% of that financing gap. And this is surprising because they only make up 36% of MSMEs in the region. So this really shows that women, particularly in the region, are lacking access to financial services. In South Asia, the financing gap is 336 billion, where women enterprises make up 7%, just 7% of the enterprises overall, and it still accounts for 27 billion in a financing gap. So overall, this indicates a large unmet financing needs of MSMEs and particularly women-owned MSMEs in the region. These gaps are due to several barriers that are faced by MSMEs, both generally, but also um, differ based on the size of enterprise. And for example, micro enterprises often have limited or no financial history impacting their ability to access a loan. There's all, they're also often unregistered. Similarly, bankability is an issue. So financial records, having business plans in place, digital financial literacy can be an issue. And particularly for women entrepreneurs, having the ability to meet customer due diligence, um, processes and KYC requirements, which is the identification requirements needed to take out a loan. And this often requires multiple forms of identification. Collateral is also a challenge. Women often don't have their names on land or movable assets, which can also inhibit their ability to take out loans. And there's also social um, constraints as well. For enterprises trans transitioning from micro to small size or SMEs themselves, 
They also fall into something that we call um, the missing middle, which is the financing gap hindering those enterprises from growth. Often their financing needs have outgrown the microfinance offerings um, and they need larger and longer loan tenures. And they also um, may not have collateral or the financial history to meet um, formal bank requirements to access those financial services. This is where digital financial services and new innovative solutions are enabling access to finance for unbanked, underbanked individuals and MSMEs in the region. And this is being seen through algor algorithm-based lending, such as use of using cell phone data, lending solutions based on receivables or inventory-based lending among a variety of other solutions. I mentioned that at SCAP, we're working with financial service providers who are developing such solutions. Um, but before I get into that, I'll just share a few um, deep dive case studies um, on what we've found in some recent studies at SCAP. And I'll make this quick. I know we are on a time limit. Um, last year, we launched a call for research proposals and the goal was to undertake primary research to better understand kind of the nuance challenges facing um, MSMEs, particularly women MSMEs and accessing finance at different stages in their enterprise journey. And the research was action oriented, um, allowing for learnings to be applied to the development of new loan products and also um, um, tailoring of specific existing loan products. And we're under currently, currently undertaking six simultaneous studies on this across the region, but I'll just focus on two right here. Um, one was undertaken in Fiji with Kiva Microfinance and SPVD. And we undertook lean data analysis of randomized SPBD clients. And this allowed for the client's voice to be heard and has resulted in learnings and adjustment of SPBD lending considerations. And the findings noted that particularly the need was for more flexible and diversified loan product offerings, allowing for longer loan terms, larger loan sizes, and longer grace periods, particularly now given the COVID-19. Um, the um, findings also noted the importance of specialization of credit products, particularly for women entrepreneurs. We saw that um, loans were taken out not only for the business, but um, those business loans were also used for home improvement and education of children. So it's important to have specialization of products to ensure that the um, funds taken are actually used for the business. Wraparound services to support businesses and starting up planning and expansion were also seen as something that's needed. Um, and that um, is something not necessarily that the financial institution itself can provide, but it can be provided through partnerships. Similarly in Bangladesh, um, we undertook studies with um, DNAT and that specifically focused on women F commerce, Facebook commerce entrepreneurs. And this is a case where Bangladesh is a good example of understanding the complex barriers faced by entrepreneurs in starting up and expanding their business. Only 8% of the entrepreneurs um, interviewed accessed a formal bank loan for their business. And most of those individuals were middle income women who used savings, but they didn't see actually credit as a main challenge. What they did see as a challenge was client relationship management, supply chain management, technology use, um, putting their products online on Facebook, online harassment was a major challenge faced and lack of support from family, um, from their family and um, undertaking their business. So Micro entrepreneurs looking to scale up though did face challenges, um, particularly in access to credit. And this was because of the um, unregistered nature of their business and lack of um, ba bank plan um, planning of their business and um, financial history. So based on this research, we are working with financial service providers to offer tailored and targeted financial services to meet the needs of MSMEs. And we are actually already doing this um, this is my last slide, so I'll just conclude here. Um, SCAP and UNCDF, we've been partnered for the last several years to support fintechs and traditional financial service providers to develop, test, and scale solutions for MSMEs. Later in this um, forum, um, next, tomorrow, you'll meet Sam from SkyEye. We're working with him to develop Samoa's first ever payments gateway. And you might ask, what does payments have to do with credit? Actually, the digitization of payments allows for digital finance history to assist in accessing loans. 
Um, and actually later in the session, you'll meet Ms. Ratha Che, the CEO of Kuman, who we're supporting in the development of training and onboarding of women entrepreneurs onto her e-commerce platform, which will allow women MSMEs to build a dashboard of their business health for financial institutions to facilitate lending. So I'll end there. Thank you very much and happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Diana. So next up is Mr. Sandeep Varma, Chief Executive Officer, Credit Guarantee Fund Trust for Micro and Small Enterprises of India, who will discuss how India facilitates collateral free lending to micro and small enterprises by providing credit guarantee. Sandeep, you have five minutes, please. Um, if uh, you have additional points, we can address them in the Q&A afterwards. The timekeeper will prompt you in the chat box. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, a warm namaste from India. As we all know, micro, small and medium enterprises play a pivotal role in the economic activities of any country world over, and more specifically in the emerging economies. Situation in India is no different. However, uh, sadly, historically, MSMEs have a very small share in available bank credit in comparison to their contribution to GDP. The financing gap is even larger when micro and informal enterprise are taken into account. Information asymmetry, lack of collateral, and higher lending costs deter desired credit flow to the sector. As the oldest trade guarantee institution of the country, that is CHGMSE, we are trying to address all these issues. National governments in various parts of the globe have been using trade guarantee scheme as an enabler for creating business environment. Guarantee schemes, when implemented alongside an improved credit infrastructure, such as credit reporting systems, collateral registries, insolvency regimes, uh, e-lending platforms, and use of alternate data for credit assessment can lead to a greater SME access to finance. The data can be used as a pivotal tool in forming policies for easing credit access for MSMEs. The credit guarantee scheme improves the credit access and financial strength of SMEs providing basically three major advantages. The one is leverage, B, regulatory capital relief, and the third one is the counter-cyclical crisis tool. Small enterprises everywhere, including India, they often find it difficult to offer immovable asset as collateral security. This was also pointed out by the speaker prior to me. In such cases, ability of the promoter to offer collateral security to secure a bank loan becomes a bigger success factor for the project rather than their entrepreneurial ability. India's central bank has therefore mandated that a smaller loan of up to rupees 1 million should be provided without insisting on collateral security. And this is where my institution comes into play. We provide a guarantee to the lending institution that in case the borrower is not able to make payment and turns out to be a non-performing asset, we step into its shoes and make good the obligation. This increases the comfort level of the lending institution. Established in year 2000 with the above objectives, uh, objectives CHMSE has grown many fold in providing guarantee to facilitating collateral free lending to borrowers up to a ceiling of rupees 20 million. Today, it is really encouraging to note that so far we have been able to provide guarantee for more than 5 million accounts, amounting to guarantee for about more than 2,500 billion Indian rupee. It has also helped in employment generation of more than 13 billion. Now, with the situation of COVID, it has unexpectedly taken a huge toll on the economies world over, and again, India is no exception. MSEs are facing a somber future with bruised balance sheets. Government is making use of credit guarantee scheme to provide help to suffering sectors rather than depending on the direct subsidy rules. A major scheme of Government of India to provide additional credit to the sector is based on the credit guarantee scheme. Similarly, CHGMSE has also been associated with the government scheme or providing relief to those units which turned into NPA, which turned bad, and to the street vendors. We are at the bottom of the pyramid. We at CHMSE are committed to increase our reach to MSME borrowers by leveraging technology in a big way. We realize that technology is the way forward. We have been making need-based modification on our schemes, parameters to bring out new variants of the product to meet the ever-growing requirement of the segment. In this connection, a mention may be made of a hybrid model in which guarantee is also provided in those events where collateral security may be available, but not to the level of satisfaction of the lender. 
So we started with an agency which was providing uh, supporting uh, collateral free. We have moved away and a hybrid model also has been initiated looking at the requirement of the sector. It has also been our endeavor to save the lending institution from rigors of legal procedures. Legal procedures every, anywhere and particularly in India is quite arduous. So according to the smaller loans, the claims are settled without the need of initiating any legal action. This not only helps the lenders by saving them from spending more than what is sought to be recovered, because many a times the legal action, this expenditure that you make, that is more than the amount this seek to recover. Uh, but this is also helpful to the small level borrower for whom the legal procedures almost work as a full stopper for all his future endeavors. To sum it up, it can be said that providing credit guarantee in lieu of collateral security works as a very, very effective tool for the marginalized section of the borrowers who, but for this instrument, would not have got an entry into the formal segment of credit lending. Going forward, organizing offering credit guarantee, including uh, organizations which are offering credit guarantee, which includes my uh, organization also, must use the humongous data they possess to strengthen the credit decision making by, uh, by the banks, which in turn will secure better, better credit flow to the MSEs. Here also, uh, as my previous speaker was saying, the algorithm based on the data, this will go a long way in providing improved credit facility to, to the MSME uh, segment, which is already uh, uh, in, in the, uh, already happening in our country and we are also working in uh, that direction. So I once again, thank you for giving me this opportunity and I will be uh, too happy to answer any questions they may come up. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sandeep, for the illuminating policy perspective from India. So the last speaker in the roundtable's first segment is Ms. Yangi, Chief Investment Officer of Equity Management of Real AI, a technology MSME based in Beijing. Um, she has four very interesting slides prepared on some experiences from China on MSME financing. So the timekeeper will prompt you when you have one minute remaining, Yangi. Thank you. Yangi, you're on mute. Can you unmute yourself, please? Okay, everybody hear me? Yes, thank you. Please continue. Okay, okay sorry about that. Uh, so just, um, uh, I will just uh, give you a brief background introduction about the Chinese economy. The SMEs plays a really important role in Chinese economy. There were more than 40 million SMEs, which accounted for over 95% of the total number of enterprises in China. They represent 59% of the overall GDP and 65% of the imports and exports in our country, while the tax revenue paid by the SMEs also accounted for more than 48% of the overall tax collected by the government. However, the SMEs experienced a major impact during the outbreak. There is an institution launched a survey on the condition of SMEs amidst the coronavirus outbreak. Uh, it shows that 80% of the surveyed firms had not resumed operations at the time of the survey, uh, which is February the 10th, 2020. And 40% uh, couldn't determine a time frame for the resumption. 20% of the surveyed firms will, uh, will be unable to last beyond a month on a cash flow basis, and 64% beyond three months, presenting a dire picture for SME bankruptcies under an extended epidemic scenario. Luckily, our government supported a lot. Uh, within the first 10 days after the Chinese Supreme Festival, the very beginning of the outbreak, 600 policies in support of smaller firms were launched. Um, preferential taxes, cutting the rental and insurance costs, and deferrals in electricity payments are all intended to reduce the liquidity strain on SMEs. But for us, uh, blindly relying on the government is not a long-term solution. We need to have our own competitiveness to cope with the changing environment. Uh, from my perspective, there are two types of barriers that affect the success of our financing. Uh, first is the internal cost. Since we only have very short history and for those large financial institutions like banks, um, we barely meet their basic requirements to get a loan. 
Here, I would like to suggest to making the best use of resources around you, like your alumni, friends, um, etc. Since those people know you the best, as I will explain later that our ice-breaking angel investor is introduced by our alumni and our University Alumni Foundation also gave us plenty of resources. Secondly, since we haven't established a mature supply chain in the early days, the company's income and expenses are unstable, which may mislead, may, may, may mislead the investor that, um, and uh, let them overestimate our risk. Therefore, we need to maintain good accounting and legal practice and more importantly, have enough commercial awareness. Only when we can generate scalable revenue and have enough influence on the market, the fluctuations in the market will hurt us less. As for the external costs, the financing channel for our SMEs are limited. Also, because we have insufficient fixed asset and collaterals, uh, we also face high financing costs. Here is a, um, here, I, I think a well-trained team and a high technology threshold will help us attract the market as well as the investors. And for the second question, it would be advised that we all need to embrace the technology development. For those who need to promote your product, you can take the advantage of MCN to deliver the message. And for those who want to share company information with the bank, but worry about the information leakage, you could learn about the privacy preserving platform. Um, let me make a brief introduction about, about our own company to illustrate my opinion. Beijing Real AI Technology Company is incubated in Institution of AI in Tsinghua University. Our team is jointly led by Zhang Bo, the Academician of Chinese Academic of Science, and Zhu Jun, the Director of the Basic Theory uh, Research Center of the Institute of Artificial Intelligence in Tsinghua University. And that is our irreplaceable team. We develop a new um, generation of AI infrastructure based on the third generation AI theory in response to the increasingly severe security problems of AI in, uh, in data algorithms and applications. It fundamentally enhanced the safety, reliability, and the controllability of AI. And that is our technical threshold. We established on July 2018 and launched our very first product for clients in finance system at the end of that year. As most of our team came from Tsinghua University, our alumni and school were of great help to us. They introduced us the first order and the first investor, and we finished our angel round financing on February 2019. And in the same year, we accelerated the product development and launched our new product for industrial customers. Also, we won the International Cybersecurity and AI Contest 2019, uh, which proved our R&D capability. And uh, because of our rapid commercialization, we got our pre-A round financing that year. Um, in fact, we're just at the beginning of our journey, and uh, there are still a lot for us to learn to learn to compete with the market. But uh, we need to bear in mind that as long as we keep flexible and uh, proactive in solving problems and uh, never give up, we can always interact with the market on an equal basis. And that's my presentation. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, um, Yang Yi, for your insights. Uh, because we're a little bit short on time, instead of doing a short Q&A here, I'm just going to launch into our second segment of the roundtable, and then we'll do a collective Q&A at the end. So the second segment focuses on new opportunities and innovations in MSME financing. So I am delighted to call on Mr. Wan H. Cho. Mr. Wan H. Cho, Managing Partner of Delight Law Group from the Republic of Korea, who will discuss innovative ways for MSME financing based on Korean case studies. So Juan, the floor is yours just for a very short five minutes and the timekeeper will prompt you in the chat box when there is one minute remaining. Thank you. Um, this is Juan. Um, let me check. Yeah, okay. This is, um, my name is Juan Cho. I'm uh, not the managing partner of, of the Delight Law Group, which is located in Seoul, Korea. Uh, it's a great honor um, to participate in a meaningful and timely forum hosted by UNSTRO. Um, I would like to explain the recent situation in Korea regarding MSME's financing and explain innovative measures for financing, 
Yeah, as you know, MSME includes um, the startup venture companies and also traditional and small and business and small business owners. So my slide will also um, the deal with um, those um, the entities. Um, the first is the venture investment in Korea. Uh, as shown in the diagram, venture investment is increasing year by year. The trend of increase is um, clear. Um, the, although um, the COVID-19 has uh, slowed down for a while in the two, uh, 2020. Um, the, in um, the regard, the investments, um, the where invest, uh, industries where investments are made, uh, there are huge investment in ICT services and the logistic services and bio and medical uh, sector. Um, this um, the part related to the investment um, the, through uh, stocks. Um, in a nutshell, uh, the stages of the investment are not accurately uh, distinguished. I think uh, it's because uh, startup and venture companies are growing fast and the investment funds are uh, increasing. Um, I summarized um, uh, I summarized um, the laws and regulation uh, related to the investment in Korea, but um, the, due to the time limitation, I'll skip the, this presentation. Uh, okay. Um, uh, this slide is an explanation of uh, the recent situation to um, the funds for MSMEs. I can mention that the government's involvement is great. Uh, there are many government funded institutions through which the government is sending uh, funds uh, down to uh, MSMEs. Uh, as you, you can see uh, from this graph, the ratio of investment through the government is around uh, 30, uh, 35%. Yeah, I, I think is a very a big portion um, of the investment. In Korea, um, um, the, the biggest role is um, the FOF, um, the fund of fund. The various government departments uh, form funds through uh, their own budget. And the fund is run by a private company called KB. Yeah, it is a way to invest indirectly through private funds. Uh, not, not directly. Um, nonetheless, there are uh, difficulties in investment that I will not uh, elaborate here. Um, uh, this uh, is uh, today's uh, main point. Um, the lot, long ago, the Korean government announced a plan called K-Venture. Uh, K-Venture uh, has uh, three important directions uh, one is um, to uh, secure global competitiveness and the Korean government, um, the plans to expand the global venture funds and overseas based networking. Yeah, in uh, this year, uh, additional um, 1 trillion won was already created in the global funds and invested um, the Korean startup overseas. The second one is fostering ESC venture uh, companies um, and second one is the private, uh, uh, public private cooperation. Um, next one is, um, I think, um, the personally uh, find the most interesting issues. Uh, it's a movement that are uh, taking place in private sector. As you know, many companies are struggling with um, the COVID-19 to support this government first supports um, money. Yeah, it's a very uh, important portion to um, the support um, um, the MSMEs, um, the struggle from the COVID-19. Um, they are also governments announcing and pursuing a policy called um, Digital New Deal. Um, the Digital New Deal aims to build a digital uh, economy and promote the growth in promising untapped uh, industries. Uh, it heightens the competitiveness of Korea and its industry by establishing uh, digital infrastructures. 
in areas such as um, data, uh, network, AI. Um, the last one is um, the new way, I think the new way uh, for financing, yeah, or, um, especially in MSMEs area. The first one is impact fund. Uh, impact fund invest in social venture mainly. Uh, the social venture uh, is a company uh, who um, try to solve the social problem. So it does not um, it does not have a goal making a lot of money. Uh, so yeah, there are a lots of investor funds to be established in Korea. So it means that uh, more and more the social venture uh, can get a, a fund from the impact fund. The second one is um, the crowdfunding. Um, many small business owners are getting help from the crowdfunding companies. Um, this screen um, is um, the site of what is uh, the Korea's number one crowdfunding company. Yeah, if there is an item I want to uh, make and sell, I can post it on the website even before I manufacture it, receive funding from it, and, and I make and sell it with the money I received from the fund. So it is a um, good opportunity for the small business owner with ideas and or skill to fund. So um, um, there are um, the several um, the crowdfunding um, the startup and crowdfunding companies uh, that um, the make a huge impact uh, for the MSMEs in Korea area. And um, this slide, this slide is um, this slide is um, the site called OK Village in southern part of Korea. Uh, they went to old city called Mokpo and opened a restaurant and motel and a shared office. However, because it is very expensive to buy uh, real estate, so they buy real estate with the citizens' money. It use it for uh, their community. Uh, in Korea, this type of local assetization, I, I'm not sure what this term is right, but uh, we call local assetization, uh, it is becoming active. So I think it is a very good way from the, from the ordinary citizen uh, in their uh, local community. So um, there are uh, yeah, new ways for funding uh, for uh, the MSMEs. Uh, that Korea's exper experience will help um, understand um, this situation. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for your enlightening presentation, Juan. Um, for those who are fans of K-drama series, you might have heard of the series Startup, which yeah. is very popular in my home country, Thailand. And it's an attestation to the startup culture here and the innovative ways of financing that is also um, available. Um, and next up, we have Ms. Georgina Nagulivu. Gina, are you here with us? Um, Gina will discuss challenges and opportunities arising from the pandemic as a local self-made e-commerce entrepreneur from Fiji. So Gina, you have a five minutes, please. Five minutes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, hope you can see my slide. Hello, can you see my slide? Oh, excellent. Yes. <laughs> Um, Bula Vinaka, everyone, and uh, welcome from the tiny island in Fiji, uh, all the way in the Pacific. Uh, it's evening here, and good morning to those uh, around the world. Um, I'll be sharing my slide and going through this five-minute presentation, talking about um, innovating for adaptation through the storm. So here in the Pacific, it's usually cyclones. Um, I'd like to tell you a good story, a fairy tale about entrepreneurship, but unfortunately, entrepreneurship is always, uh, it's not a fairy tale. It's hard work every day. Uh, so my agenda will be going through the beginning of my story. And this is personally um, going through how uh, the Husia Enterprise, South Pacific Enterprise started to the storm, to the new opportunities and how we navigated through that, as well as you get to meet the team and a summary of what we do here in Fiji. 
Uh, so to begin Hi, with, Gina. Sorry yeah. to interrupt. Um, uh, could you please put your slides on, on full screen? Is that possible? Because people can't see well. So we've received a request. So okay. thank you. Let me put that on full screen. Sorry, I can't seem to see that. Sorry about this. Is that better? Perfect, thank you. Excellent. Uh, so the beginning of my five minute story starts with uh, Mr. Sangai Tusakimi. Uh, he established a business and it was a micro enterprise in Suva. It started up as a small retail shop and then grew into a small business where he had a vision of uh, turning it into a import and export business. However, he did not have as much support at that time. Remember, this is in the 1987, and he had to focus on what his family uh, needs were and to put food on the table and ensure that his kids went to school. So he encouraged his kids to grow up, uh, have a career, and to keep in mind that to be a shopkeeper was a backup plan. Um, that was the beginning of his story, and this is the storm. He realized later that he successfully achieved his goal, but his vision still remained. He's now 78 years old and he's my dad. Um, he realized that uh, he needed someone to carry on his legacy and I'm honored to do that. And he often wonders how, how come my career spends a lot of time on the internet and the amount of investment that he had done toward my education. So my name is Georgina Nangulevu. I was born with a bilateral congenital telepathy. I am a person with disability, and I also have a strong background in software uh, development. I graduated from the University of the South Pacific in computing science and information technology. Uh, one of the things that you see before you is I'm an advocate. If you look at my profile, I'm all about digital entrepreneurship for persons with disability and vulnerable communities. That's something that I'm passionate about. And that is how I'm going to talk about the journey that I'll take you through uh, in helping my dad achieve his vision. Uh, even though he wanted to um, go into import and export, uh, in the next slide, I'll, I'll talk about what we had gone through to ensure that we navigate through the storm. So pre-COVID for 30 years, he had been running a micro small enterprise. Um, and uh, currently in this uh, time of the pandemic, we had to uh, modernize and change uh, things. So just to give you a stats of what's happening in, uh, in terms of uh, uh, people above 60, there's 90 percent in our population and persons with disability is 13.7 percent. Um, the first thing we did, uh, and I'm thankful for the opportunity given by our Fiji government uh, to attend the Fiji Commerce Entrepreneurship uh, Learnings, because I'm a person with strong tech, uh, but understanding business models, even though I grew up in in a shop environment, it's something for me to learn about business models. So because he had focused on retail and that was the main source of his business, we, we had to modernize his business model to diversify into a hub so that we could uh, help other uh, communities like us uh, that were struggling, uh, but at the same time, uh, we combine and be stronger together. And, also collaborate on a lot of inclusive projects that are dear to my heart. So what you see before you is a floor plan of what we have at the moment and the kids that are there, uh, we had uh, kids from the settlement that came to the hub and those were some of the activities we had uh, physically. Uh, the second, the other opportunities that we had to go through is that we ventured into Shopify or drop shipping uh, business models because that allowed us to transact online have uh, even though we didn't have goods uh, we'd be able to still open a retail shop online uh, without holding inventory 
um, the other thing was affiliate marketing. This is something that uh, I'm really passionate about because uh, you do a lot of research and you're able to market these things um, uh, like books. So you can market them and resell them online. Uh, cloud development, because something I'm passionate about is uh, software development. And uh, during my time as a .NET uh, developer, you had to create things from scratch. But now that we have cloud development, you can also develop online. And as a second side to it, Shop Shopify offers that uh, ability where you can create e-stores for other clients or customers that you, that you can onboard at the hub. Digital inclusion consultancy, uh, that is quote to who I am as a person with disability, uh, trying to encourage other people or other persons with disability to go into digital entrepreneurship. Uh, that's something that I provide as an ad advisory service. Um, just to let you know, also, we do have a physical hub, which I showed a, a photo of. Uh, I have a hub coordinator on present and uh, I currently have two startups on premise and three we're going to onboard by the end of December. Times are hard in Fiji, but uh, the ability to help each other as a community is something that uh, we can do together to share costs and sort of help each other succeed. Uh, in summary, uh, for, for the five minutes is that uh, one of the tips that I learned, and it's a hard one, is to take a look at your current business model, uh, try and modernize it to see areas of opportunity so that you can create uh, new products, opportunity, and revenue streams, as well as as much as possible, go digital, uh, be the best in your field uh, so that you can teach others and also be a one-stop shop of information for other people who are wanting to go into the same thing. Whether it's physical or online, uh, it's always good to have a good network of uh, communities. And one thing I'm thankful for is the Youth Entrepreneurship uh, Council that I'm a part of, uh, leaning to to learning from them is uh, something that encourages me. So that's something that I'm passionate about uh, ensuring that as an incubation hub, uh, we're able to provide that kind of service to vulnerable communities. Uh, thank you. Uh, just to let you know, yes, um, I just, I'm the managing director for Swissia South Pacific Enterprise. What I had shared is basically the things that we do in, with the resources that we have uh, for the communities that are caught to me. As a person uh, with disability, as well as an elderly father, um, trying to get financing is very difficult. So we had to be prudent in our investments and at the same time, think of ways to sort of earn money, uh, especially since we're facing a pandemic and there's a lot of business protocols in place. Hope I've uh, meet the target of your five minutes, but uh, this is just to let you know on what we are doing here. And if there's any questions, I'll answer them after the session. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gina. Um, last but not least is Ms. Ratatia, the CEO of Come On Cambodia, who will elaborate on women entrepreneurs access to finance during COVID-19 via digital platforms. But Tai, you have the last five minutes of our session. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for uh, joining us today. And I'm the last person to talk today. So um, uh, it's such a great honor for joining this discussion. Uh, COVID-19 has affecting the world economy as uh, well as Cambodia. Cambodia has expected to fully implement the industry 4.0 in the next two to three years, according to the National Strategic Development Plan, um, which aim for economic diversification by leveraging technology to promote capacity building of the most uh, SME in order that they can able to join regional and uh, global value chain. But because of the COVID-19, we were forced to learn how to walk before we can crawl. Uh, according to the MEF, 
We can see from the graph that Cambodia has been growing steadily in the past five years with the GDP average out around 7%. Uh, but in 2020, uh, our GDP down at negative 3.1%. Uh, and we are hoping that the rollout of the vaccination, the economy will slowly return to the positive side. Uh, COVID-19 have made many local uh, business shut down. Our solution is developing an all-in-one e-commerce platform with an app-based end-to-end marketplace that connect MSME, emphasize in women-led businesses to consumer in Cambodia and beyond. Chrome was developed in, uh, from scratch by Cambodian local developer. Uh, we make Chrome eShop app easy for our vendor to take order and sell from their own uh, free store, which enable women entrepreneurs to expand their market reach by increasing their sales via e-commerce marketplace platform, as well as build their financial statement that can be used as the collateral to borrow loan in the future. Um, so we have been working with a Cambodian Women Entrepreneur Association called CWA. We know what women need and want in terms of access to finance. Therefore, we had signed an MOU with CWA in September 9, 2020, and with AMK Microfinance Institute on March 19, 2021, to build a bank dashboard that enable vendor to enter their expenses and additional income to create a complete financial statement and loan application to prep for, to clear the pathway to finance for our vendor. Uh, currently, with the support of UNCDF, as mentioned by Ms. Dina earlier, uh, we are working on the project called Big Jude, mean Women Entrepreneur Capacity Upgrade to the Digital Economy. With this project initiative, we are planning to onboarding uh, 400 women lead MSME into our home by providing them with the digital and financial literacy as well as how to use our app to access to loan with our collateral. By the end of our one year pilot projects, uh, we are expecting to have 50 out of that 400 uh, MSME receive loan with our collateral. Uh, a little bit uh, to show you about our dashboard. We have um, the finance dashboard and uh, they can basically do the summary report, uh, can show the summary report. And monthly, uh, we, we show the six month history report for the bank. Uh, they can request the loan and they can on, uh, the data are coming from, uh, from uh, our sale transaction. And also they can enter the expenses and additional income that is not from Kmom into the app in order for them to get a complete uh, financial statement. And they can choose to apply loan. Right now, we currently work with AMK and in the future, we are uh, trying to connect to other bank in order to get, uh, give our vendor uh, more choice. Um, I would like to show you a little bit of uh, uh, bank dashboard. Uh, can you see my screen? Um, I think there's some stop and go, but we are at the very end. So maybe you can uh, wrap up. Maybe you can wrap up and, and tell us uh, your conclusion. Is that all right? Yes. Uh, uh, thank you very much. Um, so this is with our project um, planning to do. And uh, I'm happy to discuss further in the Q&A. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rata. Um, as we go digital, not just MSMEs, but also um, Uncitral, we've experienced uh, several problems, which we hope uh, everyone uh, uh, can appreciate. Um, thank you for your patience today. Um, so we have very little time left for q and I think, um, but many questions that have been asked in advance have actually been already answered by, by our panelists in the round table. For example, um, we had a couple questions on how to enhance MSME competitiveness. And I think our case studies from, from really uh, from China, from Kumun, also from Fiji, from, from Gina, have, have, have provided real life examples of how that can be done. For example, the use of innovation hubs, um, digitization, despite its, uh, its hiccups, is providing, providing 
is proving to be to be a godsend for for MSMEs especially. There are also questions on on our policy experts. Uh, questions to our policy experts on, on whether there were policy recommendations for developing countries. And I think um, both Diana as well as Sandeep have already answered those questions in, in their presentations. Uh, for example, um, the use of public-private ventures, if possible, um, innovative financing and facilitating by the government. And Juan had also anticipated this in his presentation by providing examples from Korea. So, so um, if you have any additional questions, please address them to uncitral.rcap at un.org and we will pass them on to our roundtable presenters today and so that they could provide further information. Their presentations will also be made available on the event webpage. Um, so thank you again to all our panelists. I'm sorry we were so short on time. But I really learned a lot. And as I said, Antetral is exploring work on this issue. So we will reach out to you in the future for your input on how we can make this better, possibly through uh, legal harmonization, which is how Antetral works with member states. So before we end, I would ask our roundtable speakers to partake in a group capture right now. All right, so if you can smile and say MSMEs, one, two, three. MSMEs. <laughs> okay, we need one more, I've been told. Okay, so one, two, three MSMEs. 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 Okay, I think we have it. Um, thank you very much, everyone. Very happy to see your smiling faces. Um, I will now pass the floor back to my colleague, Un, to close briefly today. Thank you again, everyone. A big thank you to Atita and all the participants for an excellent discussion. This ends day one of the second Incheon Law and Business Forum. On behalf of Unsitra Arkev, the Ministry of Justice, Incheon City, may I thank you for your valuable participation today. If you have any questions on today's presentations, please email us at unsitra.arkev at un.org. The forum reconvenes tomorrow at 4 p.m. Korean Standard Time. For panelists, please make sure to join the webinar 30 minutes prior to the event for the final technical test. See you tomorrow and thank you. <laughs>